right. Welcome, everybody. Apologies for the delay. Welcome to Brooklyn Community Board 2's ULERP hearing on 180 Skimmerhorn. Before I introduce the applicant, I just want to say a couple of things and remind us all of um, some of the ways that the ULERP public hearings work. Um, this is a public hearing. Uh, we will allow public members uh, of the community to have two minutes to speak on what is presented. Uh, um, board members do not speak during this time, so let's just keep that in mind. I would also ask that we respect one another's comments, whatever they may be. We may not all have the same opinions, but we all live in the same district, so we should all respect one another's comments. And with that, I will um, just remind us all we're here for the 180 Skimmerhorn ULERP. This is uh, ULERP 219K0436, C230047, ZSK, <clears throat> and N230046, ZAK, presented by Edison Properties. So, Edison Properties, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Okay, great. Uh, welcome. Please uh, be as succinct as you can while sharing all the relevant information. Um, and I will turn it over to you. Thanks. And I can share my screen. Yes, Anthony, go ahead. Okay. Everybody can see that, right? Looks great, thank you. Okay. Hi everyone, uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Anthony Borelli. I'm Senior Vice President for Edison Properties. Edison Properties is an affiliate of the applicant. Uh, I'm joined this evening by James Power, uh, our land use attorney, and Joe McKenzie from Philip Habib Associates, uh, the firm that prepared our EA EAS, uh, and Fernando Baga, um, our regional vice president for parking uh, is also with us. So thank you for holding this hearing and allowing me this opportunity to present our application. Um, as a former uh, community board district manager and director of land use for the Manhattan Borough President's Office, I truly really um, understand and appreciate your important role in the ULA process. Um, so uh, yeah, so I just wanted to acknowledge them. Jim and I will present uh, the context and the details of our application uh, to add parking capacity to the existing Edison Park Fest parking lot um, at the corner of Skimmerhorn and Hoyt. Uh, and at the end of the presentation, uh, we'd love to hear your comments. Uh, and of course, we would answer any questions um, that you have. So I'm sure you're all familiar with the location um, at the corner of Skimmerhorn and Hoyt. Um, our facility, uh, it serves local businesses, institutions, and residents. Uh, we acquired the lot in 2015, um, but we had been operating the lot for many years prior to that. Um, the, the lot has a capacity currently of 114 spaces, including 32 uh, two high lifts, mechanical lifts, um, zoning in our current certificate of occupancy permits um, up to 150 spaces as of right. Uh, and you'll see from, from this uh, Google image that uh, all the um, vehicular entries and exits happen on Skimmerhorn. I know you're familiar with the land uses in the area, um, uh, but um, just wanted to show that you know our, our location is within um, the downtown Brooklyn Central Business District at the edge of the Borum Hill um, neighborhood. The site is part of a larger zoning lot um, that has been developed by the previous owner. Um, the other developments on the zoning lot are the Skimmerhorn um, community facility, uh, residential community facility operated by Breaking Ground. Um, the Hilton Hotel is at the corner of Smith and, and Skimmerhorn. 
Uh, and there's the residential building with the entrance on at uh, 265 State Street. Those are the other developments on the same zoning lot. Uh, and the history of development on the site or on the block is important context for this application. I'll get into that a little bit later. Or I'll get into it right now. Um, the zoning um, for, the, for the site is C61. Uh, it provides for a mix of uses um, shown here, commercial, residential, and community facility. Uh, while we would uh, love to be able to develop the site with a housing project, for example, um, because all of the air rights were transferred to the other developments on the block, we're left with a prime development site uh, with zero development rights. Uh, and that's why we're here talking about parking. Um, just want to make that, that historical context clear. Here are some views, um, various perspectives on the site from the surrounding area. Again, I'm sure you're very familiar with the location, but you know, this is part of our application, wanted to show you. <clears throat> um, to support our business decision, we looked at parking data from the three census tracts nearest our lot to support um, you know, our thinking behind this application. Not surprisingly, we found a significant increase in the number of households since 2011. Uh, the proportion of households with vehicles stayed about the same. Um, but the number of households with cars increased by about 50% over that 10 year range. And while the building boom in downtown Brooklyn was happening, uh, parking lots and garages were developed for other uses, as I'm sure you've observed and are well aware of. Um, as a result, um, the number of licensed off street parking spaces dropped by about 75% over the past. 10 years. To give you a sense of our customer base, we analyzed the individual month, our individual monthly customers. 73% uh, 70, of them um, come from Brooklyn zip codes, and 63% of them are from the two immediate zip codes um, adjacent to the, to the, to the site. It's also worth pointing out that we have contracts with local institutions and service providers. Uh, a very popular program we have is with the Brooklyn Tabernacle. Um, and we have contracts with various agencies and nonprofits that service uh, the area. I'm here. So um, currently, all of our customers exit onto Skimmerhorn, as I mentioned earlier. Some turn right onto Hoyt, others make their way east onto Skimmerhorn. Um, the, the, we're showing you this to, to, to just give you a sense of the level, the volumes of trips that we have. Um, right now, based on pre-COVID data um, from, 19, uh, from 2019, um, the average number of peak hour exits on a Saturday is 12, and on the peak hour in the week, during the week, it's 18. Uh, and you'll notice that, you know, uh, non-peak hour are exits um, for both weekdays and weekends are considerably lower. Here I'm showing that between the no action scenario and the with action scenario, the scenarios we had to study as part of the um, EAS, the highest number of incremental peak hour exits on a weekday is 15. Um, and as you can see, the, the non-hour, the incremental non-hour, non-peak hour exits are considerably lower. I'm gonna hand it over to um, James Power now, who's gonna talk about our um, parking plan and the specific actions that we're requesting. Okay. 
Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, so, thank and thank you, Anthony. So here we have the proposed plan. I'll review the proposed plan and, and the land use actions. The proposed plan uh, shows there would be 245 parking spaces, including lift spaces, 21 bicycle spaces, and 12 reservoir spaces. Vehicles would enter by a 12 foot wide curb cut on Skimmerhorn Street, which is smaller and much smaller and further to the west from the existing curb cut and exit by a 10 foot wide curb cut on Hoyt Street. There would be adequate circulation space within the facility. Uh, there would be a four foot wide landscaped area around the perimeter of the parking area, along with a six foot high decorative fence. Uh, we are also proposing a landscaped seating area at the corner of Hoyt and Skimmerhorn Streets, which would total 858 square feet. It would include two radial benches and adjacent seating areas. It would incorporate uh, species from the city's recommended landscaping list, as well as elements from Downtown Brooklyn Partnership's public realm plan, and it would be maintained in perpetuity by Edison. Uh, on to the next slide, Anthony. Yeah. So our actions, our land use actions are a special permit pursuant to section 7452 of the zoning resolution to allow an increase of the parking capacity from the existing 114 spaces, our legal capacity is 150 spaces to 245, and a city planning authorization to modify certain of the perimeter landscaping requirements that are applicable to parking lots. Uh, next slide, Anthony. Uh, so our application shows that uh, we satisfy the findings of the special permit. We comply with the curb cut surfacing and screening requirements. We, uh, the parking lot serves the diverse uses in the area. It would add parking capacity, but, but would not have a significant impact on traffic or other um, environmental issues. We would reduce and relocate the curb cut, as I mentioned, to reduce the potential for pedestrian conflict. We would have required 12 reservoir spaces. And since the lot is served by a number of arterial streets, those streets would be adequate to handle any increase in traffic. Uh, next slide, Anthony. Regarding the authorization, we are requesting a reduction in the perimeter landscaping area from the required seven feet to four feet and requesting to modify the Require uh, the requirement that the landscaped area be planted with trees and have underdrain, curb inlet, and ground cover, uh, as well as the obstruction requirements to permit the six foot high decorative fence. So we show in our application that we have complied with the landscaping requirements to the maximum extent practicable, which is the finding. The lot is shallow and irregular, so that providing seven feet of landscaping would severely restrict the location of spaces and circulation within the facility. And uh, there are other zoning regulations that limit the site, including the rear yard requirements, bicycle parking requirements, reservoir space, and entrance and exit requirements. So <clears throat> for the same reasons, it would not be practical to plant the four foot perimeter area with trees or provide the under drain curb inlet or ground cover that the landscaping regulations otherwise require. Um, I'll just go through a couple of other slides here, Anthony. Um, here we have sections showing the perimeter landscaping area on the left and the seating area on the right. Next, Anthony. Uh, and some more detail about the plantings that the seating area and the seating that the uh, uh, corner area would provide. And the next slide, I think, uh, goes back to you, Anthony. Yeah, and so, <clears throat> thanks, Jim. So here's a view of our parking lot uh, from the corner. Um, we use this perspective to do an illustrative rendering of what it would look like with the improvements. And this is what it would look like with the improvements that you see the corner sitting area there with the radial benches. You'll see the four high, four high stackers, um, which are part of our application. As I mentioned previously, there are currently two high stackers 
on uh, a portion of the site. Um, and these are the same stackers, by the way, that um, are on Skimmerhorn further west at Smith Street. We have a parking lot on Smith Street and another one uh, closer to court. They're the same mechanical equipment. Uh, also wanted to just um, mention that, you know, we, we've been um, conducting, we've been having conversations with the community board and others since last fall. Um, we've been hearing questions and comments from not just community board members, but from the bids, from neighborhood association members, uh, from individuals. Uh, and so we've We've, we've tried to be responsive to those questions with the information we're able to provide. Uh, this is an example of um, some of the questions and re responses that we've received. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that this is an exhaustive list of everything I might hear tonight, uh, but maybe this will be helpful in just sort of um, focusing conversation or, or um, discussion for the remaining of the, of the presentation. So with that, thank you. Um, and um, I'll look to the community board for next steps or direction. Great, thank you. Um, Taya, should I continue or hand it over to Carlton? Um, as you wish, Dr. Yee, you could go ahead. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much. I know we have a number of hands up already. Uh, just as a quick reminder, Everyone has about two minutes, no more than two minutes. And I'm gonna to try to hold us to that because I do think there are um, many people who wanna comment on this application. So um, Taya can help me uh, make sure that I haven't missed anyone, but I'm just gonna start with the first person I see. When I call your name, please introduce yourself and um, tell us where you reside. You don't have to say your address, of course. Um, and then I'll start the clock, okay? Ms. Karstark. Apologies. Yeah. Um, could we recognize, please, the two bids that have joined us tonight? We have Atlantic Avenue bid and Downtown Brooklyn Partnership, please. Okay, recognized. Does that mean that they start? Yes, please. Okay, thanks. Um, I will call first on the Atlantic Avenue bid. Thank you so much. Um, hi, all. My name is uh, Kelly Carroll. I'm the executive director of the Atlantic Avenue bid. Um, I'm here tonight. I have presented on my, my open street in the past, so um, that's up and running. I'm not here to take questions or concerns about that. I'm here to speak directly about um, the perceived problem of traffic flow onto my open street, which is Hoyt Street between Atlantic Avenue and State Street, um, should this uh, this Euler uh, pass. Um, the initial concern was that in prior years, State Street was also a closed off street. So that is not the case this year. So when cars are now redirected southbound on to um, Hoyt Street, they are going to be able to continue along st on state um, and make rights or lefts as they need to, to get up to Squirmerhorn or down to Atlantic Avenue. So my open street on Hoyt, because of the presence of State Street being open, does not uh, make this a concern any longer. And um, so, and I also wanna thank the applicant for, for meeting with me early in my tenure here to explain the situation. Thank you. Thank you. Downtown Brooklyn Partnership. Hello everybody, Jared Grimm, Downtown Brooklyn Partnership. Um, just wanted to express um, our support for the upgrade in the parking lot at 180 Scammerhorn Street. The EIS that was completed for the 2004 rezoning um, showed that the neighborhood had a parking capacity of around um, 10,800 um, spaces across a number of garages and lots across downtown Brooklyn. Um, since then, a number have been converted to the highest and best use, residential and commercial. Um, so we've seen our net parking capacity drop to around 7,700 uh, lots. Um, 180 Skimmerhorn Street uh, is constrained in current zoning. Um, as the block developed, a number of those areas were transferred to neighboring sites. So uh, as Anthony mentioned, the site is constrained. Um, so we're, we're supportive of the upgrading of the lot and the incorporating of, the, of our landscaping elements from our public realm action plan. Um, and I will say that, you know, while we are supportive, we are optimistic that future opportunity uh, would allow for the site to be developed uh, to its highest and best use. 
um, as residential in order to address the housing shortage facing the city today. Thank you. And, and I also submitted a, a letter of testimony for the board to review as well. Thank you. Noted, thank you very much. Um, Ms. Moray. Hi, thank you so much. My zip code is 11201 and I am a neighborhood resident um, nearby. Um, I would like to speak in opposition to this proposal um, on behalf of myself and a number of neighborhood neighbors in the neighborhood on a number of different grounds. The first would be environmental. The city is very clear in its hope for a reduction of greenhouse gases, which involves a reduction of car traffic, vehicular car traffic. We live in, we are, have the luxury of living in one of the sweet spots for public transportation in the city. And so it's very concerning that we are talking about an increase in parking instead of an increase in funding for public transportation. It's no surprise that the neighborhood jail is being enhanced because this is a neighborhood that is great for people to come to by public transport. So we do not feel for environmental reasons that there's a you know, there's a great reason for increasing parking. Second is the bed, bike, and a ped safety here. Uh, thank you for the applicant for sort of trying to address that, but obviously it's a very busy uh, street now for bicycling. The city has put a great investment into upgrading the bike lane on Skimmerhorn. Um, and so, you know, increasing more cars in this neighborhood, we feel would significantly, you know, actually reduce the safety for pedestrians and bicyclists. In terms of economic development, I'm I'm sort of sad to hear the bids point of view because our point of view is that having the um, the open streets has been a boon for the economic development of the small restaurants in the neighborhood, which are right on Hoyt Street. Um, having more car traffic in and out of Hoyt Street seems a negative impact on the possibility of economic development and the feeling of uh, the neighborhood as a busy uh, restaurant destination, the top of rest restaurant destination for the neighborhood. Uh, in addition, the neighborhood character, a six uh, foot wall uh, against four car stackers. Um, the rendering you know, shows actually what the visual impact would be for the street. Uh, it is a buffer street, obviously, for the residential neighborhood. Ms. We, Moray, I have to cut you off there. I apologize. Thank last you. Last point, just historical context. These developers knew the uh, capacity of the lot when they purchased it. So it's, Thank you. Thank you. We got it. Thanks so entire. much. Thank you. Uh, Alex Guillo. Hi, uh, my name is Alex Guillo. I'm a resident, 11217. I live on State Street between Hoyt and Bond Street. Um, I mean, my concern, obviously, uh, you know, the, the person before me expressed that in terms of increasing traffic on, on this block, my, my main concern is I don't really understand why there needs to be two entrances, an entrance and one exit on Hoyt Street. By putting the exit on Hoyt Street, you basically are forcing every single one of those cars to go down Hoyt, and especially on the weekends when Hoyt Street is now closed between State and Atlantic, you basically are forcing, force feeding this traffic onto State Street, which is already a super packed, uh, you know, the, the traffic on Skummerhorn, the change of direction has had a great impact on the traffic on State Street. Um, we have a hard time, a number of neighbors and I, to understand why there couldn't be an entrance and an exit as it is today on Skummerhorn to give the option for people leaving the parking lot to either go down Skummerhorn if they choose to do so and then the left on Livingston or to make a right on Hoyt if they decide that they want to go down State Street. Uh, that doesn't make a ton of sense for us. And uh, we like to understand why is the reasoning behind it uh, because we feel this creating more congestion uh, than anything else. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Laura McCallum. Laura, you're on mute. Hello, my name is Laura McCallum. I live on State Street 11217. In addition to what Narissa and Alex have already said, I just want to uh, focus on the quality of life that is going to be changed. We already have a significant air pollution around here. It would only increase that. Sound pollution from the horns that have, uh, have increased tenfold, I swear. Um, we, we have, uh, already severe gridlock on almost every single uh, corner uh, down from, from Hoyt Street on State all the way down to Third Avenue and uh, State where I near where I live. 
Um, I also object to the, uh, that they're reducing the landscaping. We need more landscaping. We need greater space. It's a little bit of a blight right there. And um, so it, it will further um, make the, that whole area really sort of an unesthetic blemish. Thank you. Thank you. Um, after you've spoken, if you could put your hand down, that would help me out a lot. Thank you. Um, Howard Collins from the um, Borham Hill Association. Yes, thank you, Dr. Uh, uh, I am the president of the Borham Hill Association and a resident of uh, 11217, about three blocks south of this lot. Uh, we think this is just inappropriate. Uh, the area, our area, Borham Hill, this is the very northern edge, does is lacking in green space. We certainly favor development, and recently we supported the rezoning of 280, 280 Bergen, which does not include green space. We think the exit onto Hoyt Street is just plain wrong. There's a lot of cut through traffic. And if you go down Hoyt Street, and if you get to Atlantic, there's traffic back up there at Atlantic. If you go down State Street, you're stuck at Bond, you're stuck at Nevins. There's a lot of traffic there with no place to go. When you add in the fact that this increase of cars and, and eventually though jail will get rebuilt with its 280 other spaces underground, we, do we really want 400 more cars in a transit rich environment? So those are the, for me, those are the major things. The exit on Hoyt Street is a real annoyance for our neighborhood, unfair. And uh, I wanna point out that at one point, Hamlin Ventures uh, some quite some time ago, approached Steve Levin about having the city purchase this land and turn it into a green space. We would be supportive of that. We'd be supportive of some kind of uh, affordable housing component and a dog run, a dog run, a dog run, a dog run. The neighborhood gets developed and yet the community, my local community is lacking in amenities. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Howard. Aruni Renawira. Hello, um, I live on Bond around the corner from uh, this parking lot. As many people have said, there is a ton of public transportation um, in this area, right across the street is the AC, the two, three is a two minute walk away, the four or five, six, you know, five minute walk, the NQR, you know, five minute walk. There's absolutely no reason to encourage more people to drive into this community. Um, the the Scammerhorn bike lane was just constructed and people are using it, you know, it's, it's always full of bikes. Um, there's no reason to add more cars crossing this bike lane, creating more danger for cyclists and pedestrians. There's a lot of kids in this neighborhood. There's no need to encourage more cars that are can be very dangerous. Well, even even if without the Hoyt exit, the adding more cars on the Scammerhorn exit is continues to be dangerous. This parking lot should be removed entirely, and there's absolutely no reason we should be increasing it. That's moving in the opposite direction. In terms of the landscaping component, um, I agree with the person who spoke before that said this should be a green space entirely. It's a little bit insulting that. This request is at requesting for the landscaping to be reduced from seven to four feet on top of adding parking on top of what the community has clearly been advocating for years to be a green space. So, yeah, speaking in opposition of this um, on those grounds. Thank you very much. I do not see other hands. Is there anyone else? in attendance who would like to speak. Oh, one one brand new hand, Mr. Newcomb. Please go ahead. Yes, hi, my name is T.R. Newcomb. Uh, I live on State Street. Um, and I just wanna echo everything that that the opposition, people in opposition have stated before with, with one emphasis. Um, I live very close to the intersection of State and Hoyt. And I can say that while the incremental number of cars coming out of the Hoyt Street curb cut might only add a few more cars, redirecting all the traffic onto Hoyt Street created would create a tremendous amount of uh, congestion, in my opinion. Um, the the experience that we had when Skimmerhorn went from two way a two way street to one way street really created a giant pain point at that intersection, especially when it's headed straight into an open street on Hoyt Street, to the point that a lot of cars were making a right to head the wrong way at speed down State Street to escape that trap which for a residential community was just incredibly dangerous. So my biggest opposition is to the to redirecting all the traffic out of the Hoyt Street and, uh, exit. 
Um, but I think that all the, uh, the other points that have been made today are, are very valid as well. Thank you. Anyone else? One more new hand, Angel yeah. Zimmick. <laughs> Thank you. Go ahead, Angel. Hi there. Um, yes, I'm also a resident of um, State Street between Hoyt and Bond. And I echo all the sentiments of people that are opposing this. I agree with all the points that they've made. Um, I also have a concern, you know, there's talk about congestion pricing coming to lower Manhattan, which will mean that a lot of drivers from outside of the neighborhood, many from Long Island, many from Queen, uh, out of portions of Queens or whatever, they already park and take up street spaces. Um, we'll be coming in, if this increase goes through, we'll be coming into our neighborhood and again, increasing the pollution and all the other um, uh, stuff that people have already mentioned. But um, also, this, I think that the aesthetically, that somebody also mentioned, that aesthetically, it's just hideous to have stackable. In a residential neighborhood, there are people whose backyards look out over that nobody wants to look out at a bunch of stacked cars. You know, if you walk up to the corner where their other lot is, it's hideous and it's unsightly and doesn't uh, do anything to enhance our neighborhood. So I'm, I oppose also. Thank you. And I see Anne Arn. Oh, Anne? She was there. She's still there. Okay, please. Thank you, Emily. Please, Anne, go ahead. Ms. Okay, you can hear me now, right? Yes. Sorry, I, I also want to speak in opposition to this. Um, I also live on State Street between Hoyt and Bond, um, and where we've experienced a lot more traffic as a result of, you know, traffic flow changes, the bike lane, Skirmerhorn, uh, and open streets, um, all of which we support, of course, and um, the bike lanes especially. Uh, but putting more traffic, forcing more traffic to turn onto state is is not a good idea. And it seems like it's really in direct opposition to having open streets and having all these amenities and, you know, taking advantage of the public transportation as we do. So um, and I agree with everyone else, the the the, the unattractiveness of the metal wall and um, despite the um, nice plantings and things, it's really ugly. And um, uh, also, I, I'm questioning why it, they couldn't have the exit, uh, and I, I don't promote more parking spaces anyways, but even if there were, I don't know why they couldn't have the exit onto Skirmawarn, especially since they're saying that there are so few exits per hour. Um, so that's uh, my feeling about it, and I would definitely oppose increasing that, and I uh, support uh, if there's a problem developing it. Uh, doing something else with it altogether, as Howard suggests. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you put your hand down, Anne, please? Oh, I'm trying to do that. <laughs> Thank you. I take a minute. I'm on my phone. First time doing that. No problem. Okay. I saw Taya put a last call in the chat. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak? There's one woman with her hand up, Aruni. Oh, did you already speak? I did, but I had a question. Okay, hang on, hold, hold one yep. second. Um, any other comments, public comments? Okay, going once, going twice. We're gonna close the public hearing at 6.52. Um, Taya, help me out here. Uh, do we gavel in the land use committee meeting before we take comments and questions on the presentation? Take one question now and then proceed. Okay. Okay. Great. Aruni, please go ahead. Yeah, I had a question about the the air rights um, situation. So it looks like this this parking garage is multiple stories. So why can't a multiple story development be built at that same height if there's an air rights issue, like a housing development? I can answer that, I, but it probably shouldn't be me. Go ahead. I, I, I think you're asking uh, why, I, I think you're suggesting that the parking lot or is already using floor area and why can't that 
floor area be used for housing instead? Is that the question? Yes, uh, my understanding yeah. was that it, housing couldn't, yeah, couldn't yeah. be built because there was the yeah, air the, rights. The issue. parking lot has zero floor area uh, and it, it does not have any existing floor area and it doesn't have any floor area available. Nothing on the parking lot generates any floor area. We cannot build any new structures on, on that site under the current zone. So it's not necessarily air rights. But, well, floor area, yeah, air rights are a form of floor area. Air rights would be if we had floor area that we could use from next door. But yeah, so there, there's no floor area or air rights available to us. Got it. All right, thank you so much. So I'm going to gavel in, or Carlton, I can pass the gavel to you um, for the land use regular thank monthly meeting. Thank you very much, Daughtry. Thank you for uh, picking up for me while I was having hell with the cyber barriers uh, on our new uh, system. And yes, we now will start at, what is it, 6.55 p.m., the meeting for the Landmark Land Use Committee of Community Board 2. Uh, again, I thank Daughtry for, uh, as co-chair for picking up and uh, carrying on the hearing. And we'll, uh, and I also thank Karen Johnson, who is uh, still volunteering to do uh, as a second or do secretarial duty for us. Uh, thank you very much, Karen. All right, so we have that. Uh, again, we'll uh, first we'll look at the uh, agenda and I'll ask if there's, okay, but I think yeah. she left. So if you want to, if someone wants to follow up and see if she's coming back, I can continue taking minutes. Oh, okay. No, I don't. If, if you want, Jessica, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, we appreciate it. Yes. Okay. You're, you're, you're more than welcome. We need all the help <laughs> we can get. Back, someone can check. Okay. Thank you. All yes, right. Sir. Yes. So, yes, it's good to have. So, Jessica Thurston will be our acting. <laughs> secretarial person for this meeting. So thank you very much, that's Jessica. Okay, so now uh, we'll look, uh, first we'll take a look at the agenda uh, and ask if, if, we'll, if there is no uh, objection, we'll let them adopt the agenda as uh, published. So moved. Hearing, okay, thank you. Hearing no objections, the agenda will be adopted, thank you. Uh, all right, and like I said, we have our meeting here. We have a, uh, and okay, we'll ask for, I've given you the uh, who's going to be doing this. So again, we'll be following what we have listed in the agenda. Uh, and I guess we'll now ask for any, uh, if there are no further comments from the, uh, from from our committee members, uh, we'll ask for any comments from the public uh, concerning the agenda. Hearing no comments, uh, we'll proceed with our agenda, and we'll uh, we'll pick up with the um, discussion of 180 Skimmerhorn Street, uh, at least the uh, the parking lot, and ask for comments or questions from board members and committee members. Okay, I guess I see, well, I guess people want to raise their hand. I see Miss Ali, we'll start with Miss Ali then. You're muted. Yeah, oh, one is about the egress. Um, unlike a lot of your, um, earlier people that, that testified, I want to say, I think we need the parking spaces in an enclosed space so people don't double park all over the city. And Brooklyn is congested. There are a lot of people moving in there with cars. Um, I'm asking about the egress as to why is it, do you put it on Hoyt and not on Skirmahorn? Is it because the property width is narrower on the Skirmahorn side? And my second question is, could you have had more than 12 reservoir spaces on the property? And maybe you want to explain what's the reservoir spaces in case there are people who don't know what that is. 
is that for me to respond directly? Yes, yeah, so you can go Anyone ahead. Anyone from the presenters? Okay. <clears throat> yes. So, um, and I can share the screen if you'd like me to share the screen. Sure, show sure, it. that would be helpful. Okay. So, uh, our proposed parking plan is here. So the reason we have the exit, initially we went into city planning with a plan that essentially maintained the, the type of operations we currently have. In other words, entrances and exits from Skimmerhorn only. That did not work with the uh, city planning's preferred layout for public parking lots of this type. So we had to work with city planning um, and we had to design a layout that worked for them and with zoning. <clears throat> and this was the result where we had entrances only on Skimmerhorn and exits only onto Hoy. So that's how this came about through a discussion with city planning and their um, technical advisors. That said, uh, we have looked at whether or not we could accommodate an exit onto Skimmerhorn. In other words, instead of having a single lane in, we would have a, a lane in next to a lane out onto Skimmerhorn. That's technically possible. It would result in the loss of two stacker um, equipment uh, elements in eight spaces. Operationally, it could happen. Uh, it is technically within scope of the environmental study. Um, it's not our preferred option uh, and it's not city planning's pre preference either, uh, but that said, it's within scope, it could happen. The reservoir spaces, as you see here, are numbered one through 12. Those are the 12 required uh, reservoir spaces based on the capacity of our lot. You'll see here in the middle, there are there is space that technically could accommodate additional reservoir spaces. We only needed to show 12. Here are the 12, but we could accommodate additional ones in the space between two and three and four, if you follow me. And the reservoir space is a space that's necessary to bring cars into the facility efficiently and smoothly uh, in order not to cause backup on the street. And so the idea is let's get the cars into the facility, into a space where they can be accommodated easily so they're not backed up on the sidewalk or in the roadway. Okay, I guess I thought you had everything in entrance and exit on um, Hoyt. And now that you explained it's on two streets, entrance on one side, exits on the other, I think that offers a better flow. And um, I wouldn't want you to lose eight spots, but couldn't you increase the 12 spots, the 12 reservoirs so that you don't have anything waiting on the streets? No, the, the, the 12 spots is sufficient to avoid backup onto the street based on the capacity we're asking for. So the 12 is the number that, that you know, the, that, you know. The, it's the, the minimum, numbers. couldn't you increase it? We, there actually is more space. Like there's space between car number two and car number three and four. Uh -huh. That technically is reservoir space, but we don't, like in order to meet the requirements, we didn't need to show it, but th they're there. More cars could be, be accommodated um, within Inside the, the spot, okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. Mr. Lee, uh, next I see on my, I'll go by what I have my screen. I have Bill Flanoy next. Okay, thank you, Chair Gordon. Yeah, hi everyone, my name is Bill Flanoy. I am a longtime resident of Hoyt Street. I've been living there since before the upzone, when there was lots of parking <laughs> because <laughs> the individuals who are now living in downtown Brooklyn, uh, many of these individuals who are complaining about parking took up all the parking when they actually put up their houses. And um, I just found it interesting. Um, <laughs> one of the things that we were talking about earlier is that 
Uh, because we've lost so much parking, we've lost about 40% of the parking. And because of all the residents that have now moved in, thousands, we have even less capacity for parking because all the individuals have also have brought their cars into downtown Brooklyn themselves. We lost the parking that was by Macy's that was completely taken away for development. We have lost parking in other places that were basically parking lots that are now been developed. Unfortunately, with development, with the loss of parking and the new cars that have come in, it has become a problem that has been created by the very individuals who are now complaining about the fact there's no parking. Um, previously, when uh, you presented, one of the problems I had personally was the fact that you had cars going onto Hoyt Street because at the time, the open streets was going from Atlantic to Skirmhorn, okay? Because of the change of how the open streets are now working, the open streets between, um, on Hoyt, between Skirmhorn and, uh, I forgot, uh, what's that, I believe State Street, that's now available for people to drive on. And not only will the park, people who are parking will drive on it, other individuals will drive on it also anyway because that's now open for all traffic, not just traffic from the parking lot, but for all traffic. So irregardless of how you're complaining about the individuals in the parking lot, you're gonna have traffic anyway. Okay, now as far as the uh, actual, the cars, as far as the, the way they are uh, moved front and as for the stackers were four stories high, previously the stackers were in the back against the housing. And people were complaining about that. They didn't want those stacks behind, right by their backyards. So they moved it forward. So they took in consideration that the residents didn't want the stackers against their backyards. So they moved them forward. Now, in addition to this, a lot of individuals who do come into Brooklyn to shop aren't necessarily residents in Brooklyn. Uh, also, Brooklyn Tabernacle, I just got finished talking to them yesterday. A lot of their people who are who go to the Brooklyn Tabernacle do not live in Brooklyn. They live throughout the other boroughs and drive into Brooklyn. In a lot of cases, these individuals are parking blocks away to walk. And these are elderly people in their 50s, 60s, 70s who have to now walk all the way to Brooklyn Tabernacle because there's no parking. Brooklyn Tabernacle has made an agreement, okay, to actually have individuals park at this parking lot. So what I'm looking at basically is this parking is needed. I had to get rid of my own car because I got tired of parking all the way in Borough Hill. Prior to this, I could park in downtown Brooklyn. I can't park in downtown Brooklyn anymore because there's no parking. We need parking. We were promised parking before, uh, and that parking was the underground parking. It was supposed to have a couple hundred cars parked underground. That was decayed. Okay, so we don't have that parking either. Um, I'm also, to be honest, I have to also disclose that I'm on the downtown Brooklyn partnership on the board. Okay. Yes, I see Daltrey. <laughs> I want to make a motion to approve, okay, the presentation. Yes, I am doing that as presented. Seconded. If you want a motion. second. Okay, we have a motion sorry, and I'm... seconded not yet on the table. Um, sorry. But we will continue discussion. Okay, so the next person I have, okay. You you made your we finished bill. Thank I'm done. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, next person I see on uh, my list on my uh, screen is Je Jessica Thurston, uh, as board member. You can uh, speak, Jessica. Sorry, quickly. Point of procedure. Sorry, Jessica. Oh. Can, oh, uh, Taya, can you clarify? There's a motion on the table. It's been seconded. Does discussion continue? Discussion on the motion may continue. On the motion, like clarifying what it includes and what it doesn't. We do not yes. continue discussion on the presentation at this point because a motion has been made. Correct? That correct. That is correct. Okay, so no. Whoever made the motion cut off all discussion. 
That well, is that's, correct. Uh, with that said, I am next and I can make, my, my comment is on the motion. Mm -hmm. uh, for to the applicant, I'm Jessica Thurston, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm an officer of this board. We have an obligation as the community board to reflect community input. I will note for older board members a few years ago when we had the discussion around helicopter noise in Brooklyn Heights and a lot of folks thought it was fine because they didn't live in Brooklyn Heights. And we talked about how we are here to listen to the voices of the community, all of whom wanted to control the noise of helicopters in Brooklyn Heights. Tonight, we heard from community members, all of whom were opposed to this. We have an obligation to represent them while also having a role on this board and thinking about the future of our district. It is backwards to add more parking in a district that is already facing such congestion. And please note, especially for those that are not board members, I hope it is clear that this is a choice these developers are making. They are not obligated to add more parking. They could make this green space. They could make this low level housing or a community space. This does not have to be parking. It is a financial choice they are making at the expense of the health and safety of our communities. It is incredibly important that we make responsible choices on this board. And I urge the Land Use Committee to vote this down. And when it comes to the board and to our executive committee, I will also not support it. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, next person I see on my screen is Emily, uh, board member Emily Agdu. Um, I make a motion to table the motion so that you we can continue. Well, you can't do that. Can't Sorry, do so, several, okay. several, several point of, points of order. Um, yeah. Because a motion has been made by the land use committee, only that motion can be discussed and unfortunately only by the members of this committee. Yeah. So sorry on that one, Emily. Uh, Ted, Ted has a question. Ted, point of order here, just a curiosity. Ted, based on the fact that discussion has been closed because of my motion, and it seems that some of the committee members would like to continue discussion about this, I would like to withdraw my motion to allow you committee members to continue. You can do that. I will do that. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so so that I will, motion has so been... Motion has been withdrawn for the for the time being. Okay, so okay. Con so may I use may my continue. opportunity now to General speak? Discussion may continue. So may uh, I? Okay. Is it committee yeah, members though? Okay, I'm sorry, ahead. Emily. Is it committee members or is or it board members? Sorry. Board members. Board members. Yeah. Can so let discuss, the committee members. Of course. Yeah, board members can discuss as well as committee members. Just that it's uh, of course, only committee members can. Uh, do the vote. Uh, next, I guess, I guess, do, I guess I'll do go to Daughtry, then to Brian. Thank you very much. Um, I just, I'm not going to take too much time. I just want to echo um, all of the opposition comments that have been stated here. I live on State Street. I've been here since 2002. I've been on the board, I don't know how long, a number of years. Um, and I just wanted to, to reiterate that I feel like this is going in the wrong direction, that just because um, you you know you you've got parking there. It's not like we're taking it away. You can extend parking opportunities to Brooklyn Tabernacle and others within the realm of what you currently have. What you're asking for is a, a, a doubling in effect of what you currently have. You have 150 capacity space by your CFO, which by the way I couldn't find online anywhere. Uh, but I trust that you have it. You have 114 spaces now. You're you're going to 245. You're putting four story high stackers against Skimmerhorn Street. You're endangering pedestrian and bike safety. You're making it uglier for the neighborhood. And when you provide parking for people, they drive. That is a fact. And that is not where we need to be going in the 21st century. Um, so I will stop there and uh, lower my hand. Thank you. Thank you, Joshua. Uh, next will be Brian Howland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, if uh, any of y'all go to the New York Times website, you'll see that the top story today and has been all day is heat will likely soar to record levels in the next five years, new analysis says. 
This is by the World Meteor Meteorological uh, Organization, which is the UN's climate change um, or climate um, <clears throat> arm. We're talking about uh, adding parking when we know what that will bring. Certainly we cannot stop climate change as a committee or a board, but little decisions like this made by committees and boards across this country, uh, across the city, are what causes this problem to continue and get worse. And today's news was a startling departure that some of the worst of climate change would happen much more soon than we thought. Um, I'd also add that uh, members of, of this board and this committee at times uh, make the claim that you know, we should listen to the community and we should listen to the people who came and attended the meeting. I don't particularly subscribe to the idea that we are bound to honor whatever those who attended the particular meeting on a subject um, have to say. Um, but I would ask that those who believe that stay consistent to that. Anyway, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, next, I see on my screen is Ernest Augustus. Hi, Mr. Ernie, can you come can off me, me, please? Okay, now I can hear you. Can you hear me? Um, I listened to Bill Pinoy, and I think he made a very reasoned, rational discussion about the loss of parking in downtown Brooklyn. Uh, this uh, this issue is, is pertaining to this particular site, uh, and we should speak to this site. Um, you know, I know people who think that um, uh, cars are the devil's instrument, but let me explain to you. You know, you have in New York City, not only do you have 20, 30 something, you have uh, 60, 70, 80 something. As you uh, age, you become more car dependent, unfortunately. You know, I made this argument be before cars are are needed. Uh, people are aging in their homes uh, and they're not flooding nursing homes or senior center homes. They are aging in their home. There is a need. There are ADA uh, requirements. Uh, but, uh, there's a lawsuit now because of open street that has impacted uh, ADA. Uh, and uh, that's never anyone's consideration. You know, it should be your consideration. You do not live in a uh, segregated thirty-something-year-old uh, community. Uh, there are uh, there are seniors, and I've seen this. I think that on this particular site, uh, it's not going to dramatically increase uh, uh, more cars since you have lost a number of uh, parking spaces uh, over the years in downtown. Brooklyn, uh, but on this particular site, I would agree with Bill Benoit, and I would support his motion to approve this project. Thank you, Ernest. I see next uh, board member Emily Adu. Um, so apologies, I forget the woman's name who spoke early on from the community, but she she referenced that there was a development restriction that the developers were aware of when they purchased the site. Um, and developers didn't have a chance to speak to that. So I just wanted to get clarification um, on what you were aware of prior to purchasing the site. Um, Chair uh, Carlton, if I can address that at um, Mr. Borelli. That's the question. I don't... Can I answer? If you wish, yes. Yeah, so yeah, we were fully aware of the, um... <laughs> development potential or lack thereof the site. I mean, we are, we're a real estate company. We own real estate across the city in, in Northern New Jersey. Um, we're, we're not just parking lot operators, but we are parking lot operators. So this site, um, as I told you before, we had, we had been operating parking there for a number of years. Um, and I should add, you'll remember like the, almost the entire block was parking. Sorry. Um, to Sorry to cut you off. It was just a yes or no question. So I appreciate the yes that you that you were aware. Um, because I just had another question. I just want to make sure that we have time, but thank you for the additional context. Um, how much 
are these additional spots worth to you a year? I don't know. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Thomas Hooge. I'm, I'm sorry. I keep messing up your last name. It's all right. Uh, thank you, Chair Gordon. Uh, uh, I am encouraging the committee to uh, vote no on this proposal. Uh, we don't need more car traffic in this neighborhood. You build more parking, you're incentivizing more people to drive in the community. There's transit station just across the corner. There's, there are several bus stops. Uh, and I, I'm, I wanna address a, a comment I heard about uh, the ADA accessibility of the neighborhood. I wanna point out that when you have a curb cut, that means there are cars driving over the sidewalk. That means that a driver can stop in the sidewalk and block someone in a wheelchair from being able to proceed. Uh, I am a bike commuter and I actually use the Shermorn Street bike lane on a daily basis. Uh, I, from my own personal experience, I see drivers stopping on the sidewalk. They'll get out of their car, they'll, they'll check their car. Once they've left the parking lot, they decide that's the appropriate time to start inspecting their car. Uh, they stop in the bike lane sometimes too. So the people who actually use this, this parking lot are not good stewards. Uh, of the parking lot of the neighborhood and they're generally bad neighbors i would say so by adding more parking spots you're you're going to create more people who, who who behave like that so uh i'm opposed to this proposal on many grounds but honestly if if, if we're just if we're just going to go by has this has the site been a good partner of the neighborhood the parking attendants see how the drivers behave they don't tell them not to stop on the sidewalk. They don't tell them not to stop in the bike lane. So they clearly don't care about the neighborhood. They just want to collect their parking rent. Uh, so I, I would encourage the committee to vote now. Thanks. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, I see I see Bill, but before I go to Bill, I see a Melinda Rasco from the board. I'll take Melinda. Okay, yes, thank you. Hi, not only am I a member of the board, I'm also um, a Borham Hill resident. And I'm asking the committee to vote no on this for all of the reasons that were mentioned. I'm not gonna go through that again. And don't take this as a threat, but <laughs> if you do vote yes, I will be voting no at our meeting on this. And I'll also be um, imploring other committee members um, excuse me, other board members to vote no as well. So not a threat, but just a question, please vote no. <laughs> thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. All right, uh, here's how we'll do it. Um, Ernest and Ms. Ali had vote, right, briefly uh, state your uh, points and then I'm gonna go to Bill. Are you calling on me, Carlton? Uh, our, okay, I'll do you. Since I'm, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I just want to remind people that downtown Brooklyn is a business district. And yes, Borum Hill has become, with all the new buildings, heavily residential. But a lot of the courts are there and people go downtown. For every defendant, there's two lawyers. There's one for the plaintiff, one for the defendant. So people come in and they do hourly parking. It's not people who live there or just come to, to park their luxury vehicle. If you don't have places for them to park, they'll still come down there and they'll circle and drive and burn gas, making circles, looking for a place. I have been down there, downtown, and found that a number of those parking spots were full. They put their full um, spot outside because they can't accommodate the amount of people driving in to do business. It is a business district. That's all I have to say, but I would like to, to continue with the motion if, if Bill is ready to make that motion again. Okay. Uh, we'll, I'll go to Bill. Let me just finish with uh, uh, board uh, committee members who wish to say, have something to say. I see uh, again, Brian, Brian, you wanted one, one last comment. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I also add that <clears throat> Some of the people in the city who are most likely 
to be users of public transportation, not to drive for the city's elderly. I know my own grandmother is 80, 87 years old. She's never owned a car in her life uh, and commutes by public transit, by walking in the city. Um, I respect that there are people, elderly or not, who need their cars, um, but let's not confuse the fact that most of the people, most of the elderly people in the city uh, do not commute with a car, do not need a car. Um, I just don't want them uh, used as a prop like this. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Ernest, Ernest Augustus, ready? Yes, I am. Again, you know, Hazard hit it on the head. Downtown Brooklyn is a central business district, it's a municipal district, it's a business district. Uh, and uh, elderly and seniors are not prop. They aren't being exploited. They aren't, to, they aren't supposed to be demonized. They're human beings and they have their interests. You know, uh, they have a legitimate need. And uh, it also, uh, it helps businesses. Uh, if you want to go, we don't take the bus if we have to go to criminal court or landlord's tenant court and rate. Some people drive down there either by, by taxi or by their own vehicle and they park to uh, conduct municipal business, uh, rather uh, doing property search or attending court or uh, hearings, uh, and, they, and they have to come downtown Brooklyn. Uh, it is not a residential neighborhood in the classic sense. You are but and uh, and spill off into a central business district. What the parameters are uh, beyond uh, Atlantic Avenue may have more residential neighborhood, but in this instance, uh, you know, you're in the central business district. One of the things that I observed that when uh, Gaze and Tala closed uh, and people weren't coming down there because there was no parking, uh, now they're trying to recoup, but uh, Again, uh, this is a diverse city. Uh, uh, downtown Brooklyn uh, is a is a entrance and exit to the major uh, high uh, high raise the bridges, whether it's the Manhattan Bridge or the Brooklyn Bridge, that brings cars downtown and through that neighborhood. But also, people live down there. As Bill has Bill had been down there what twenty years or more, Bill, and he already outlined he outlined what has occurred that has developed, you know? And, you know, as much as you make a uh, complaint about it, uh, cars aren't going any place, you know? People are still gonna need it and, you know, and they make their own private commercial decision in terms of what, how they're gonna spend their money. But uh, again, on this particular uh, application, it's specific to this application, uh, the number of units that's on that lot uh, it'll not going to overwhelm uh, this neighborhood at this point. Thank you. Bill Flanoy. Thank you, Chair Gordon. Uh, thank you very much. I, I've listened to everyone. I've heard everyone say what they had to say. Um, and what I'm going to suggest is this. I'm being pragmatic here, not emotional. Okay. What we're looking at right now is currently at the corner of Scrummerhorn and Hoy Street, you have a police, okay, uh, for the Metro uh, Politan Police, okay? Their cars are parked on the sidewalk because there's no place to park them. They need parking to park the police cars because they have been parking in the bike lanes. Yes, Daltry. <laughs> they've, <been> <laughs> they've been parking in the park and the, in the bike lanes, and now they're parked um, almost always on the sidewalk along Skirmahon. You have the courthouses that are there. And by the way, there are four business districts in the immediate area. That means there are four districts with people who have businesses there who need people to be able to get there okay, on a regular basis. This was a business district before it was a residential district, not the other way around. So the businesses were there first. The residents came in afterwards. And as the residents came in, they took up all the parking 
and the parking was like actually eliminated. That parking lot was always there. One of the biggest problems, however, is that it's over the, the railroad lot, uh, the railroad, uh, the, uh, sorry, the uh, subway stations. So to actually build above the subway station is almost impossible. The building across from me took five years to be built because it's over the subway line. So what I'm trying to say is it's a limited amount of space down there and there's a lot of residents down there. The businesses need to have people be able to get down there to actually shop. Now, I realize that everyone believes that this is a bad situation. Air pollution, cars, we have the cars. They're not gonna go away. The cars are gonna drive down there anyway. That's why we had all the parking lots to begin with. So pragmatically, and I understand what you all are stating, but being pragmatic, we need the parking in downtown Brooklyn. We have office spaces. We have individuals commuting in from all other places. We need, they need some place to park that's not an hourly lot, okay? If you have to park and it's hourly, you have to keep, go out there and keep feeding the meters. If you're in an office, you can't really do that. That is why I'm saying be pragmatic. We need this parking. And again, I'm gonna make the motion to accept the presentation as presented. And I will second it. Motion's, motion's been laid before the committee and second. Are there any questions or comments on the motion? I have a comment on the motion, which is um, I respect your motions, but I don't think that it reflects the commentary that we've heard, inclusive of, um, you know, multiple people who have been in opposition. So I'm just going to leave it there. Thank you, Daughtry. Any further comments or questions? Very none. I will take the, uh, we'll do a call. I guess I'll do the call on this one uh, for uh, the members. Ms. Ali? Yes. Ernest Augustus. Mm -hmm. Ernest. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, hold on. Okay. One moment. Okay. Yes. Is the is Esther Blunt uh, with us today? Ms. Blanche is not present. She's in Morocco. Oh, okay. Oh, that's right. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> I'm glad you reminded me. Daughtry Kostoffen? No. Okay. Next is uh is John Dew with us today? No. Mr. Dew is not present. Okay. Bill Flanoy. Oh, up here, yes. Okay. Brian Holland? No. Okay, I'll go last. Is Karen still there or did she leave for her? Uh, Ms. Johnson Karen will left. not be returning to the meeting. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, Yvette Richards, mid Yvette Richardson in? I'm here. Okay. I vote no. You vote no, okay. Thank you, Yvette. Uh, Stanton? No. no, no. I think okay. you represent the community. Okay. The vote no. Okay, thank you. And, uh, Oh, yes. And, and, and Cheryl Williams. Is Cheryl Williams with us today? Yes. Yes and okay. yes. Yes and yes. Okay. All right. Uh, and I will vote yes. Oh, wow. So that's five. Five, and four. Five, four, four. Five to four in favor of the 
So it's uh, five to four in favor. I just want to say, thank you. I just yeah. want to say that I feel like we missed a real opportunity to put some conditions on this application. And that is unfortunate. I'm not saying that we wouldn't have approved it eventually, potentially, with some reduction in parking spaces, with some other gives, but we didn't even try, you guys. We didn't even try. You didn't bring it up either. I didn't have a chance. <laughs> I had my hand up. You put up the same motion on the floor for the second time. I waited till everyone spoke. I had well, my hand up. <laughs> well, it could still be done at the uh, board meeting. You know, we'll still have a uh, discussion at the board meeting itself. This will be the first chance. So, any, any um, amendments or ideas could be also brought up at the uh, at the, at the general meeting, in, at the general meeting. Yes, could be brought up at that time. So the motion does carry. All right. Uh, now we're going over to the our landmark preservation commission certificates of appropriateness. Uh, the first one is 302 Grand Avenue uh, slash 50 Clifton Street. And on this one, this is we, these are two new buildings for which actually this committee and board did approve uh, some months ago. Uh, the applicant has returned to the, uh, to the committee because they want to make some initial, some more uh, adjustments, some and some more uh, what they feel were some different. They want to do some improvements to the their application. Uh, they're looking at especially uh, doing some work on let's see on the Fifty Clifton place particularly. They look they want to look at trying to make it less of a brownstone type of building. And uh, the 302 uh, Grand, they're looking at doing some more work on some of the exteriors, uh, especially, you know, so we'll leave it up basically to the presenter to tell us uh, what additional work you wish to do for 302 Grand Street, Grand Avenue, and, uh, uh, and uh, 50 Clifton uh, Street. Hi, uh, my name's Krista Demardash. Um, uh, I'm the architect for the owners of the site, and um, you're correct. This was approved a few months back. We have since had um, our working meetings with Landmarks, and the uh, commissioner had made a few requests on um, basically the aesthetics of the building, and they thought it was a good idea that we just present it to you one more time, um, or again, I should say. Uh, so if I can share my screen, I can point out the changes. Okay. Oh, um, if I go right to this one, which compares the two um, on the Clifton 50 Clifton place, what they've asked us to do is to treat it less like a, uh, a historic brownstone and make it a little bit more modern rather than copy the old details, kind of strip them of the details. So we remove the arched windows from the second and the third floor. Um, we removed the lintels over the windows. We reduced the size of the lintel over the front door. And we actually reduced the size of the um, uh, cornice. And I apologize, it's, it's shot at a very weird angle. So it actually looks larger, mm -hmm. but, but it is, it is uh, smaller indeed. Um, on the 302 Grand Avenue, um, they asked us to reduce the height of the parapet and set it back um, and use um, a glass so that the height would not be the same on the two buildings. Um, sorry, I, and then they asked us to remove the side entrance over here and make it straight off of uh, Grand Avenue. Um, we also removed um, the protruding bricks and did more of a brick detail around each window. And I can find that one for you. So you can see there a little bit better um, that there is now just a brick detailing, a lower, the building's lower, the entrance was moved to the front. Is that basically what you wanted to present? 
Yep, that's, I mean, I can go through the whole presentation again, but- No, no. Are, All right, that's <laughs> a, if, if you, so just as a reminder, we saw this presentation and I think what um, we're voting on tonight is just the changes that the architect described in very quickly and succinctly, that's correct, thank Audrey. you. Yeah. Are there any questions or comments from uh, committee members, board members? I do have a question. Sure. Go ahead, um, Audrey. I really like what's happened with uh, um, the Grand Street building, 302. Mm -hmm. If I don't under, and I think actually it's an it's an improvement over the last iteration. I don't, I, and I also like the elevation on Grand Street of the other building. But if you wouldn't mind going back to the um, the the front elevations, mm -hmm. um, I don't understand Landmark's request to basically take the historic details or the references to the historic details off of the Clifton Place frontage. Can you speak to that? Um, I, you know, they didn't, I, you know, we spoke about it. They kind of, they were being, uh, my, my, my uh, contacts there were saying that the, their boss was saying that you can't replicate it. it. We all know it's new. It's not going to be old. So let's not make it look old. Let's, you know, or traditional. Let's make it look uh, more in keeping in, in, in a modern times. Sure. So that, that was their. I'm familiar with that. Yeah. And I think that that's mm -hmm. true. And um, I just think it, it doesn't, that this frontage or this elevation doesn't quite do that enough for me. Like you've still got okay. the one over one windows and you still got the cornice and it still references the historic buildings, but they've taken some of that detail away. So I don't really understand that. I'll be quiet now. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you, uh, Daughtry. Uh, on my screen next, I do see Yvette. Yvette Richardson. Thank you, Chair. Can everybody hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Here okay. you go ahead. Um, I just I just have a question on 302 Grand because I understand that the entrance is now right off of Grand, but I also see that there's a is that side um, awning? Is that just um, entrance or um, to the courtyard? So they have a they have a side yard or a, a side terrace, mm -hmm. and that is a um, an entrance out to their side terrace with a with a sunshade shading over it. Okay, and is that shared with the adjacent building, or that's only for three hundred two? Uh, no, it's only for three hundred two. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, hey, next to my screen, I see Miss Ellie. Uh, I have a question about the rear of the 302 grant. Is that a driveway at the back of the um the property? Because there's an existing driveway now. Yes, yeah, so the curb cut is being relocated and that will be a driveway that will go between the two buildings. To so to get so the on building. the side, on the very left side of- Oh, of uh, this is the adjacent- um, this is the adjacent property. That's a one-story commercial building. Like a shed. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I, this is right opposite where I live and I'm very moved to do a motion to approve as presented, but I'll wait till the rest of okay, yeah. the members well, speak. I'll call on you when we're uh, finished. Sure. The, uh, sure. Okay. Okay. Well, Stanton, go ahead. Yes. My question for the um, architect is whether or not on the, uh, what does, what is the, I guess it's the Grand Street side. I'm looking at the, I, I can't touch the screen because it's mm -hmm. frozen it. Um, the, what's currently on the screen. Yep. Would you consider putting, um, a, adding a mountain or something to, to the windows? You've, you definitely, remove the cornice. I mean, I, I see what you've done to modernize it. And I think it would be still clearly look like a brand new building, which it is, uh, if you added some division on the windows. Um, Taken away, we, uh, I, I don't think that would, I think that would help. It just looks way too blank, I think. Um, we. We did discuss that with landmarks when we were working on the changes to this elevation, and it it uh, through our discussions we we went back to this one. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from committee members, board members? Motion to approve. Oh. 
Okay. Oh, okay. Ms. Sorry, Hosrick, go ahead. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, Miss Ellie, do you wish a second? Yes, I wish to. Okay. The treat is it your motion? I would second it. Okay, so motion to approve as presented. Hello. Hello. Can I take a motion? Hello. Who? Hello. Who are you? Hi, I'm Sean Linda. I live on Clifton Place. I'll give you a moment as a courtesy. Normally, we don't. Uh, this is just for the uh, board members and committee members. Okay, thank you so much. My, I just, my, my question, Mike, is um, when I'm looking at the plan, the building width is 25 feet, correct? Correct. On a Clifton Place. Correct. Right? And the lot size is 25 feet, correct? And the, sorry, the what? The lot is 25 feet wide, correct? It's the whole lot is is 25 by 100. And this correct. will be two buildings on a single zoning lot with okay, separate so tax when I look, lots. When I look at the pictures for Clifton, well, when I'm 50 Clifton, and it shows that the building, there's a little fence small little fence that you're creating where there's like a few feet of land in between the, within the lot. So if the building is 25 feet wide. How is there space for a little side garden that you have in the pictures? Oh, on the, on the Grand Avenue side or on the Clifton side? On the Clifton side. Um, well, it, the, the lot is deeper than 25 feet wide. No, I'm talking and... width. I'm talking the width is deeper than 25 feet. Um, because it should only be 25 feet. There's an existing the, uh, fence on Grand, so that's no, part of creating uh, the house. Yeah, so that's, that's not feet. part of. Okay, the okay, folks, let's let's keep this orderly. <laughs> One person was called on to speak. Please, what is your question? My question is, if how are you able to create a side little garden on the side if the building is taking up this entire 25 feet size of the lot? So the 25 feet is to the zoning side, the, the, the planting side there, that's an existing fence. And that fence will just be rebuilt in the same place. And we're just doing plantings along there. Yeah, but the planting seems like it's encompassed of the lot, which the lot is only to be the width of the building. Um, okay, do you so, have uh, a site plan that you can show if you yeah, want to answer yeah, this? Please. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. You can okay. Yeah. Let's. I want to wrap this up. Um, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Get to this. Um, I think I can zoom in. So the the tax lot is twenty five by forty five. This oh. space. Ms. Demerbeck, I'm sorry, Krista, we, yeah. we stopped sharing your screen. Can you reshare your screen, please? Oh, okay. So sorry. No uh, problem. I, I unfortunately, I don't have the screen in front of me. So I'm not seeing it. I'm, I can't get into this Zoom, but I'm hearing it through video. But I've looked at the plans and I've seen, I've seen, I've seen them. Um, okay. Um, so. Krista, go please. ahead and reshare your screen, please, for the committee's view. Yeah. <laughs> I just did, and then I lost it again. Um, do you have it now? No. Here yeah. it comes. It's, it's loading. It's okay. loading. Here it comes. Okay. So um, this is this is the existing zoning lot. This can is can you existing... zoom in, please? Sorry, yep. sorry to interrupt you. Uh, hold on. When I do that, I'm gonna. I might lose you. Is that me? Uh, sorry. Okay. Uh, okay. I think we'll. I'm. I'm. Well, I'm going to end the discussion on, on this point, sir. I'm sorry. sorry. Uh, we have a motion. It's been uh, seconded. Uh, we have the discussions from all the committee members. As a courtesy, I've given you time, but we have to move on to the other uh, people who are waiting for us. So, uh, I'm going to move. I want to move this along. Now, if there are any, are there any other comments from board members or committee members on the motion, which has been presented and duly seconded? Hearing none, I'm going to proceed with the count. 
Okay. Uh, Miss Ali? Yes. Ernest Augustus? Uh, yes. Okay. Next is, okay, we know that you, hold on, Daughtry Kostoffin? Yes. Okay. Next is Bill Flanoy? Yes. Brian Holland? Yes. Just go ahead, Yvette Richardson. Yes. Okay. And then Yvette Richardson. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Miss Stanton? No. Mm -hmm. Next is uh, Cheryl. Okay, Cheryl Williams. Yes. Okay. And I'll also vote yes. So I come up with five, six, seven, eight, two, one, of, of an approval of the motion for three o two Grand Avenue and fifty Clifton Place. That's been approved. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Next one is one Sydney Place in the Brooklyn Heights Historic District. And the request is removing sh uh, shingles to be replaced by uh, new shingle, well, new type of shingles for this particular place. Hi, good evening. So, Okay. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. Hi, my name is Ilya Vilnitz. I'm the architect for the owner. Uh, can I uh, share my screen, please? Okay. Loading. There it is. And could you pop to full screen, please? So this is the existing building. The area I'd like to discuss with you all today is this uh, condition up here on the fifth floor. Currently, the building um, has a mansard roof that has uh, asphalt shingles cladding this area. And we'd like to propose a substitute for um, a slate composite shingle. <clears throat> this, is the, this is the location of the building in the Brooklyn Heights Historic District. A site plan here. It's on the corner of Sydney Place and Jerolamon. This is the existing tax photo, and this is the area in question here. So this is a close-up of what the existing condition looks like. It's it's heavily deteriorating, and we'd like to remove these um, non-historic uh, shingles and replace it with this uh, item here. A mock-up is there, so it's a uh, a beveled edge, uh, federal gray uh, composite slate shingle. <clears throat> this is the uh, Jerome Street elevation. So you can see here, this area here would, would uh, more look like this. This is the Sydney Place elevation. And uh, the secondary facade elevation, um, uh, just as you wrap the corner in Sydney. So that's the that's that's the entire presentation. But the point the point I'd like to come ac across is that uh, just you know we'd like to uh, re restore this portion of the building to a more historic appeal to match the um, uh, the tax photo from the 1940s. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions or comments from committee members, board members? I see Bill Flanoy's hand up. Yeah, hi. Thank you, uh, Chair Gordon. I'm just curious. Uh, you mentioned the tax, uh, the, the tax photo. Do you have a copy of the tax photo so we can actually see what the original look and color were? Yes. Yeah, yeah. This is the tax photo here. Oh, sorry. Here, you just had it. Yeah, there you go. Ah, it's black and white. 
Yeah, they usually are. <laughs> yeah. No, I was kind of hoping that, you know, we had a better idea <laughs> and it's far away. So I don't know what the actual pattern was of the shingles. It's, it's, a, it's like a hexagon pattern. Actually, the, the neighbor has a, a portion of um, uh, their facade uh, still intact. In so I can pull up a photo of that if you just give me one second. Yeah, because the shingles you're looking to put up are quite different than the ones that are actually there right now. And I'm kind of wondering what the historic images look like. And the color is also different too. If you can do it, fine. If not, we'll. Uh... Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm having some trouble. Yeah, um... no, I, I understand. It's not me. Yeah. I had a lot of difficulty so, in getting online today, so it's <laughs> you could you could you could see it, you could kind of see it in this picture here. Yeah, this a, a portion of the shingles remain. So the color of, of what you're looking at is similar to that, similar to, to that, correct? It's it's similar. The the uh, I was up here to take a closer look at the shingles, and they're you know uh, about a hundred years old, so they have discolored and they have weathered and it's hard to really actually understand what the uh, original color was. Um, so we, we would be installing um, a little piece of trim between the two buildings so that um, you can kind of distinguish uh, where one uh, oh, thank, set of thank you, Ted. thank you very much. I appreciate that. Okay, I got the answer I need. My hand is up. Okay, uh, okay go ahead, Judy. Um, this the BHA committee saw this. I don't know if you were going to ask, but we did, um, and we approved it when the restoration when actual state real slate was proposed. But our committee was unanimous in saying, and and by the way, there are several working architects on our committee in saying that while initially synthetic may look just like real slate, but there are changes in coloration that over time and because there's an adjacent slate roof um, that they, they were all unanimous unanimously opposed to using synthetic material here just for the record thank you uh okay let's see who else is on my, okay i see brian howland and on on my screen Thank you. Um, I'm just curious, because uh, I believe we saw a presentation on this building um, last year as well um, that included a uh, <clears throat> new bulkhead and roof terrace. I'm just curious if uh, these, if the condition of the shingles was just determined to be uh, to deteriorate subsequent to that? Well, no, no we, uh, the, the, the whole building right now is being renovated. And we're, uh, the owner is experiencing cost overruns. And um, in order to finish the building, we're looking for opportunities to uh, value engineer. And, and this is uh, one option that we're trying to explore. Okay, thank you very much for the honest answer. My hand is up, Carlton. No, oh, go ahead. Our committee, as, as regards the cost savings, our committee, suggested that maybe they revisit the garage and the cost of the garage in lieu of um, changing to synthetic slate. They, they didn't think Thanks, that much man. money would be safe. Well, okay. All right. Okay, understood. Yeah, you. the garage is the garage is critical to to the building um, the building's program. And we do think we uh, achieve a very uh, historically appropriate uh, finish mitz product by using this, the slate shingle. Trouble is, it's right next to a real slate roof. That's the trouble. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stanton. Uh, Ms. Ali? 
Yeah, yeah actually, my me. question was about the slate because I was wondering if it looked like a 12 inch panel with some fake um, patterns, oh. a hexagonal pattern. Is that what the, the, the um, synthetic material was? Are they in panels of 12? <laughs> Maybe sixteen. No, feet? no, it's actually no, it's actually that that was just a mock-up that I showed. Uh, uh, it's a combination of five tiles that were arranged that way. So each piece is independently hand laid, just like the original slate is. And it's it has panel the tools to, to hang it, just like you would um, real Correct. slate. Yeah. Correct. You try to get reclaimed slate because I know there are companies like in Vermont that would ship real slate to you you just have to buy more than you need because a lot of them are damaged yeah I, I think we want to you know do justice to the restoration and you know we're we're, we're putting in a new cornice restoring the existing cornice so i think we'd want to have uh, a finished product um, uh, installed at the building rather than a reclaimed product something that's that's uh you know dimensionally consistent no no i'm just saying the slate they even though they're reclaimed they're they're just as good it's just that some cracked and and in transportation some because i i renovated a property and I had to do exactly that out in queens but i like the project and i i think if cost is a factor i don't think a homeowner should um be held um at ransom because they're not able to afford real slate i don't even know if you could find new real slate i know you could find reclaim ones all right okay, so i, I i'm ready to make a motion but um i guess we should wait to hear okay. from the others well, I have one more. Daughtry Kostoffin. Daughtry, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, I this is a tough one for me personally because I am very familiar with budgetary constraints. I'm an architect, I build affordable and supportive housing. I know how this works. The problem, as Judy stated, is that you are directly adjacent to a real slate roof. And I want to call everyone's attention to uh, a couple of residents from that building who have written letters in opposition to the synthetic material. Um, and I just, you know, it's hard for, it's hard, the socialist in me comes out because I don't think it's fair that the community then has to take a hit because of an individual family's budgetary constraints when in fact, you know, there's a lot of other um, opportunity, I think, to, to conserve money and meet the budget. So I just wanted to share that those are my concerns on this. Daughtry, I see no other um, committee members or board members for comments or questions. Uh, I think Ms. Ali is asked to uh, make a motion. Yes, I would like to make a motion and accept it as presented. I think we need okay, to be right. mindful of people's budgets. And when they're okay. trying to do the right thing and bring it back, the way it looked in the tax photo. We have a motion and we have a second. A second. A second from, uh, is that a Ernest, Ernest. Augustus? Ernest, uh, okay. Yes. So second. Okay, thank you. Motions are made to approve as presented and duly seconded. Are there any questions or comments on the uh, motion? Okay, hearing none, I'll, uh, we'll start again with the uh, roll. Uh, okay, Miss Ali? Yes. Okay. Yes. Ernest Augustus? Ernest? Ernest, how do you vote? I'll Mr. move on and then I'll I come back. I think he's to him. frozen. He he did oh. second the motion. Okay, yeah. I'll move on and we'll, I'll come back to him. Uh, Daughtry. Uh, mm, uh, yes. Want me to move on? I'll no, move on. Yes. No, I said yes. I stated my yes. concerns. Okay. Thank you, Daughtry. Uh, Bill Flanoy. Yeah, I'm kind of like. 
with Dolce right now. I'm going to, I'm leaning both directions, but I'm right, going to I'll come back to you. Vote yes, to. You vote yes. Okay. Ryan Howland. Yes. Okay. Next is Yvette Richardson. Yes. Okay. And uh, that's hold on. Yes, it's uh, with mm. Judy. And, and, yeah, Judy, Judy Stanton. I vote no. No, all right. And yourself. Wait a minute, okay. Cheryl. Oh, wait, 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 one more. Cheryl Williams. Yes. Okay. Miss Yvette. And now me. Yes, I'll vote yes also. Did Yvette so comes vote? Out. Yeah, Yvette voted. just voted. Mm -hmm. Yes, so it comes out to seven to one for the in favor of the uh, application. I have eight to so one, just for the record. Eight, it's eight to eight, one. Eight, okay, maybe I, I missed them so, somewhere. Okay, thank you. Eight to one in favor for approving one Sydney place. All right, now we're staying in Brooklyn Heights and we move over to 158 you know, Clinton Street. Uh, and is we want to do a good bit of work around the building uh, concerning uh, the facades. And yes, basically we're doing a lot of doing a lot of work around the facade of the building. So you can go ahead on 158 Clinton Place. Uh, doing some work on the brownstone, we're finishing, we're finishing it. And yeah. Mm -hmm. um, hello, uh, my name is Mark Barak. I'm a principal at Can they unmute oh, This me? is for 158 Clinton Street. Oh, sorry, uh, I'm the that. architect yeah. for the owner on this project. Yeah, I'm, my name is Dale Lunin. Yes. Jumped in. Mm -hmm. But I'll be quick, Mark, so you'll get your turn. Sure enough. <laughs> okay, um, however you want to uh, do, do it. <laughs> Okay, um, I'll go ahead and share my screen there. Um, I'll, I'll present the project uh, briefly in its totality as far as it, how it presents on the exterior. Um, the three points that are um, up for a Landmark Commission public hearing review are the front windows are being replaced and proposed to be painted black, which is typical. I'll show you that in a second. Um, and then at the rear of the house, there's a rear addition proposed and a, a, a dormer at the roof proposed. The dormer uh, is in review for its visibility. Uh, from the street and its scale and the rear addition is a review for its visibility from the street. So let me try to share my screen here. While you do that, I just wanna thank you for articulating what the points that we are to vote on are. My pleasure. Um, okay, so I'll go through it quickly here. So here um, on the left is the tax photo, 1940, and on the right are uh, the existing conditions uh, of the house at 158 Clinton Street. Uh, here we are identifying location uh, within the Brooklyn Heights uh, district. And here looking at a Sanborn map from 1886 and 1969, zooming in, you see the, um, the original sort of like rare editions that were in existence in 1886 here on the left. And then uh, in 1969, at that point in time, how the rare editions had sort of grown uh, over, the, over time. Uh, again, we're... So, at the, so very briefly at the, at the front facade, um, the only thing under consideration is the paint, where new wood windows going in, um, they're currently one over one, they're being proposed as six over six uh, and nine over nine at the parlor level to be painted black. Um, the reason this is going to public hearing is because this is a Greek revival townhouse in the LPC guidelines, Greek revival townhouses are does need to have white painted windows. However, in Brooklyn Heights, vast majority are painted black and we're proposing paint them black similar to the condition they are now. They're being replaced because of their just um, very poor condition of the existing windows. And, okay. Um, sorry, I it's going back and forth. Okay, we're also proposing changing the front door. This is this is just for, for your knowledge. Uh, the historic tax uh, map photo here on the left 
um, is what we're proposing going back to. So that's what's drawn here on the right. And in the center is the existing condition. So the new door going in, what we have with the current conditions on the left here, and this is be very similar to what's at 164 and 166 Clinton here, a more uh, traditional uh, Greek uh, revival uh, entry condition, but that's not under consideration here. Um, at the front facade, there is a, a carve out that's not an addition that's just fully not visible here. It was in the report that was in the uh, summary in today's agenda, but that's not under consideration for a public hearing. Uh, so going to the site map, we're going to look at the rear of the house, which is really the bulk of the proposal being that we're talking about. All right. So here we are uh, in our tax, in our uh, zoning, in our block, rather. Um, we're right here with the star, and this is the proposal here. Uh, a th basement plus two stories, so considered three stories at addition, uh, with a small section that's two stories. And you can see in relationship to all the other existing um, uh, rare additions on this block, both in how far it projects into the rear yard from the existing, from the original building and its height. So we're trying to demonstrate that it's contextual to this particular block. Um, photos looking around. So the one place you can see this addition um, from the public way is over here on Incom Place, through this little sliver of space here. Uh, and we'll see this image a couple of times. That's number three here. I'll just zoom in. I'll try to zoom in here. Try to zoom in. Sorry. So you see it here in this view. So we're this small building back here. And we'll see it again in a moment. We'll point it out more clearly, potentially. Okay. And then looking inside the block, you know, same map over here, just looking kind of so you kind of get a sense of what the inside of this block looks like. Now, directly behind uh, 158 overhand sitting place they have this is the three story uh, rare addition that you see right here right right behind our um, 158 Clinton um, and you just get the general um, sort of you know sense of the character of the inside of this block here in these photographs along with a series of like occupiable roof decks and terraces that exist um, and then uh, the next image will show the proposal but here is a reference to Rare additions throughout Brooklyn Heights, a historic district, uh, showing multi-story rare additions, including uh, multi-story sort of uh, uh, bays in the rare uh, additions. And then here, looking at dormers, these particular dormers are at front facades, ours at the rear facade, which just to give a sense of uh, the scale of existing in the neighborhood. All right, so then our proposal here, um, you see in this um, axonometric, you see the existing uh, building. Um, I should say there's a fourth item of solar panels at the roof of this addition. Um, you might, LPC is currently kind of taking this into out of the hands of commissioners and they're going to move it into the hands of uh, uh, the staff level. But currently the, the solar panels are technically part of the uh, public hearing process here. They're one and, a, one and a quarter inches deep, so they will not be visible from the street. They're on top of the existing proposed, uh, the, on top of the proposed dormer rather. So here we see the addition. Exonometric here from the owner's rear yard looking at it. And here we see that photo from Aitken Place, identifying 158 Clinton Street here, the three kind of small windows right there, and then the rendering showing both the dormer and the rare addition. And this is the most visible location from Aitken Place. We also have built a mock up of the dormer, which was requested by um, uh, Brooklyn Heights Association and as well as LPC. So here you see here, this is the mock-up of the dormer um, at the existing roof. So you see it here kind of zoomed in a bit and here from the sort of public way, this is the kind of the best view across the street here. You sort of see it in relationship to the neighbors. And then just in elevation, the rare addition proposal. So this is the garden level here, the parlor level, uh, a little step back here um, for the second floor. You see here in the distance here, that's the existing uh, building's rear facade, uh, so sort of left in place. Materials of the addition are red brick, um, free patinaed copper at the bay, and then uh, a natural wood at the addition. For the that that's at the like the, the window frames. And just to give you an understanding of the building section, the existing 
and the proposed. There's an elevator um, in the proposal. The elevator stops short uh, and does not penetrate the overhead. Um, the over run will not penetrate the roof line. Again, right down the middle of the building. And here it goes through the dormer, through the carver out the front. Um, and you see the entirety of the, of the addition here. It's sort of like a, a terracing sort of effect in place. Um, right, so that's the presentation. Okay, so one more time, can you summarize? Sorry, Carlton, can you please just reiterate yeah. what we're voting on here? Yeah, um, the front windows which are being replaced, uh, the windows to be painted black. Two, the dormer, it's uh, appropriateness in scale and visibility. And three, the rear addition, it's appropriateness in visibility. And I guess four, sorry, is solar panels on the roof of the dormer. Very helpful, thank you. Yeah, and I understand that the 1940 tax photo was your guiding, I guess, uh, reference point. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's, that's um, that's I also understand the, that the, the new um, Yeah, I also understand that uh, the Brooklyn Heights Association has uh, gone mm -hmm. over this with you. Yeah, so we did present. We presented it to Brooklyn Heights Association. Uh, Judy was on that particular call. They provided a feedback in writing. I don't know if they shared it uh, with uh, CB2 at this time or they'll share it in the future, but um, yeah, I'll let you speak to it, Judy. Yeah, we, can... yeah, we did. Stanton's here, so yeah, she, can, she can share it right now. We had a very thorough review. Can you hear me, Carlton? Yeah, I can hear you. Um, by the way, this is a poster child of a good presentation for the Landmarks Commission very complete, very good photos. Um, everything about it is very, it's very well presented. Just a good example of a really well put together landmarks C of A application. But our committee felt that we would support the keeping the windows black. There are a lot of Greek, Greek revivals in Brooklyn Heights and many of them, most of them have black windows, but it, it's common even though originally they were probably all white long ago. So we support that. We also think that the dormer is minimally visible. Um, and so we really had no objection. There, the rear facade is a little busy, but that's not the subject for this committee. It's, it's the visibility that, that's at, at issue. And um, we are approved every aspect of it. We didn't see the solar panels, but I don't think the committee would have objected uh, to them. Anyway, I don't, and I'm the one voting for myself here. But I've given you the BHA summary. Thank you. Are there any other comments from uh, committee members or board members? Oh, I do see Daughtry's hand up. I'm gonna defer to Ms. Richardson. Okay. Okay, thank you. I just wanted some clarity because um, I, I didn't quite get what the material of the new dormer is going to be? I know you went through the materials, but the dormer specifically, what material is that going to be? Painted black wood. And the windows are wood windows that are being replaced with wood windows and the dormer is also having wood windows or? Yes, wood windows throughout, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Vet. Okay, uh, Daughtry. I'd like to make a motion to approve as presented. Okay, do we have a second? I do, I second. Okay, motions made by Daughtry and second by Judy Stanton. Are there any comments or questions on the motion? Hearing none, we'll proceed. In second, Mr. Gordon, it would be my pleasure to read the roll if you like. Oh, okay, you can go ahead. I have, I have it in front of me now. No problem, okay. Ms. Ms. Ali. Ms. Ali? Yes. Oh, okay, go ahead. go ahead. Augustus? Yes. Karstarfin? Yes. Flannoy? Yes. Howold? Yes. Richardson. Yes. Stanton. 
Yes. Williams. Yes. And Chair Gordon. Yes. Congratulations, that's nine zero zero. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, we move, it's still in Brooklyn Heights, but now we're moving over to 30 College Place. Uh, they're looking at doing the work on the, uh, you know, on, again, a lot of front work, a lot of on the, and also doing some work on some excavation, which I am concerned about. So I have to hear a little bit more about that as well. Uh, work will be done at the corner, on the corners, and also to be work on the garage and replacing the garage door. Um, Go ahead. Thank you. And I apologize, Dale, about jumping the gun. My name is Mark Barak. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Go ahead. Great. Um, my name is Mark Barak. I'm a principal at TTLS Architecture. I'm here with our project manager, Eric Ying, and um, the owners of the property are also following on the call. Thank you for giving us an opportunity to present our project. It's located at 30 College Place, and we're currently applying for Landmark Preservation Commission approval. It's a carriage house, and we are bringing a few items to discuss with you, specifically building a rooftop addition, front facade restoration. We've been working hand in hand with our Landmark staff member on how to restore the original details and cornice, modifications to the rear facade, lowering of the cellar slab and associated interior renovations. So um, I wanted to give you a little bit of context. A college place is a dead end street and our property is almost at the end of it. We've highlighted it here. It's a 20 foot wide lot, 82 feet deep. You're not sharing. Oh, that would be helpful. Thank you. Property is 20 feet wide, 82 feet deep. Can you guys see clearly? Yes, go ahead. So we've been working with our landmarks representative on um, recreating some of the historic photos you see. Specifically, we've zeroed in on the 1960 historic photo. This was something that was brought up during our BHA session. You can see 30 is right here in the middle. And based on this historic photo, you could see that it was originally a natural brick. It wasn't painted. It's in the middle of the Brooklyn Heights Historic District, as you can see in the landmarks map. <clears throat> we wanted to share some context images and also let you see how it fits in terms of the neighborhood. Um, looking at the house itself, you can pair up all of these images with the um, location marks on the plan, but we wanted to make sure we could give you a full scope of the property by not only taking photos up and down College Place, but also going around the perimeter streets from Henry and Hicks. It's important to note that in its current state, it's only visible from College Place, and that there's no other pockets of view that are available throughout the rest of the area. As we zoom in on the actual unit itself, you can see some of the neighboring buildings and you can also see how we've approached the rear yard. For example, in picture number three, you can see the state of the current rear facade. Picture number two, you can see the current front facade. There's been modifications to the home over the years, such as changing out the garage door, painting the brick and other sorts of cladding details, all of which we plan to restore back to the original photos. We also wanted to share some images of the roof since we'll be making some modifications to that as well. And I wanted to highlight the building to the north. They've also done um, a similarly scaled bulkhead addition. And we were using a lot of their scale and geometry as a cue for ours in terms of visibility. If we wanna briefly look through the existing plans, the cellar is a small crawl space that's only on the front portion of the property. And because of that, we will talk about what we plan to do with the cellar in a little bit. The main floor of the house is occupied primarily by a garage. As you pass through, there's a small living area. And there's also two staircases which take you up to the main living floor. The main living floor could also act as a standalone unit where you have two bedrooms facing the rear and the living room has a small Juliet balcony facing the street. Currently, the roof is um, a population of different skylights and roof hatches. Looking at the front facade, 
Our intention is to restore it back to the original landmark images, but we also wanted to highlight a few areas that we'll be focusing on. The garage door is not to the original design. They've also had work to the windows, which would be modernized, but using the same wood clad um, mullion based window system that you see. The front entry door would be returned and the Juliet balcony would be matching the original photos. Pardon me. The rear facade is currently not visible from the street, but we wanted to mark how the current status is of the brick. We also wanted to highlight the configuration of the doors and windows. There's currently an access door to the rear yard to the north, and then two windows that are on the ground level. Our proposal calls for a rooftop addition. We want to clearly state that this rooftop addition is not visible from any street. And we worked using a mock-up and 3D modeling tools to ensure that the visibility angles are really minimized. In fact, we went through numerous revisions where we modified the roof angle in order to make sure it wouldn't be visible from the street, as well as any of the mechanical units. In order to do that, the slope of the roof actually curves towards the street, and that allows us to move more of our mechanical equipment and our higher ceiling heights towards the rear yard. Along with landmarks, we built a full-scale mock-up of the addition and the mechanical units, and we wanted to be clear to document it from any visible angle. While some of the initial photos that you see are taken from the rooftop, so you can see how visible it is using orange markings and to show the scale of it, we then took a tour around the neighborhood, photographing the house from different angles just to ensure that there was no visibility from the street. Same thing from the other side, just to confirm that there really wouldn't be any obstructions or visibility for any pedestrian passing by. In our new proposed design, we are planning on lowering the cellar slab to make it a more functional space. We've prepared two different schemes, which we can share in a moment, but the primary goal was to create more, to occupy create more occupiable space in the cellar. The main floor will keep the central garage as the primary form of entry, but then we've reconfigured some of the living spaces to make a larger living area on the main floor and opened up the rear yard with more glazing. Moving up the building, we've flanked the house with bedrooms and then created a primary suite that's on the top floor. The primary suite it has a rear deck, but the front area would be for mechanical and um, planting purposes. The top of the bulkhead would have some mechanical equipment and we've deliberately placed the air condensers towards the rear yard to help us um, minimize any view lines. We wanted to do a side-by-side -side analysis of the front facade. In its current state, there were a lot of non-traditional moments. And so we itemized each of the changes in which we plan to restore. And we also wanted to use a lot of that language to use reclaimed brick for the entire new addition on the top. We also want to reiterate that none of this addition would be visible from the street, but we wanted to keep the local context and language reminiscent throughout the new design. The rear of the facade includes not only the new bulkhead, but we're reconfiguring the windows so that it would better fit the bedroom configuration. And on the main floor, we were able to create larger glazing units and another location for the door. While we created a physical mock-up, we also did digital mock-ups so that we could see how this space was going to be working in 3D. And we did a view analysis and section to show how, based on the width of the street, there would be very little visibility, if any. We are currently in the process of exploring two techniques for lowering the cellar slab. The more straightforward approach would be to underpin the party walls. This would mean that we would have access agreements from both of the neighboring parties and use an underpinning method to rebuild the, the facade, I sorry, to rebuild the foundation at a lower height, thus building a new cellar slab lower. We are also exploring the idea of using a retaining wall. This means that rather than building our cellar slab up to the party wall, 
it would be inset three feet and that would act as a retaining wall and we would lower the slab once we get within that threshold. Lastly, we wanted to um, ensure that we've posted notifications to the residents and neighbors and also including our window detail. We'll be using a Marvin window, which is wood clad on the exterior to um, recreate the original landmarks looks. Thank you guys again for taking the time to let us present. Are you currently in contact with your with the neighbors who have with the party? Well, I guess that's two, one to the left and one to the right. Uh, so are you in contact with them and, and are they informed as to the, uh, the potential work that you wish to do, I guess, for the seller? Um, that's a very valid question. Um, our property owners have been communicating with both neighbors, and this is part of a longer ongoing conversation about access agreements. I can say that over the course of this time period, we've still been pursuing both options. Um, they haven't reached um, any sort of consensus yet, but we are still in communication. Okay, because one of our concerns that we get in some of these applications is the work that's being done by the applicant will affect, of course, uh, neighboring buildings or and neighboring owners. We want to be sure that before we uh, say go right ahead, that the neighbors are aware of it and that they will be covered and that they'll they will not be harmed by any potential work because this is a rather tricky work that you're, uh, you know, in. I would say it's being suggested. Um, no, and that's a very valid concern. Um, and it's based on how our discussion goes with our neighbors, which foundation strategy we choose to pursue. Okay. Are there any other? Uh, okay, I can see Miss Elise first on. Uh, Hand up. Hold on. Can you? I just want to say that. Am I on mute? Oh, you're on mute. No, go ahead. Yes. I hear you. Okay. I just want to say it's a very tasteful project. I like it very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Stanton, go ahead. Yes. Uh, can you explain how you're going to treat the front corners? On the, uh, is, are you going to restore it? Because it looks as if it's in pretty good condition. It is. Okay. Um, in fact, we're very lucky compared to a lot of cornices. Um, but what we are going to do is, if you look at the original tax photos, let me go back to the original. Um, it was um, a different, oh, let me share my screen. Sorry. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Thank you. Um, we want to make sure that we're picking up all of the original cues of the materiality from the original cornices. So we would make sure that there was no damage or rot to the existing cornice, and then we would paint it to match. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next, I see, okay, well, I see two, People who are not on committee normally, we don't uh, take on our people from, who are not on our board or our committee, but I'll speak for a moment. Stanley Kupfer, uh, what's your interest in this? Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Stanley Kupfer, and I'm an attorney, and I represent Robert Iannucci, who is the owner of 28 College Place. That is the neighboring property to this uh, home at 30 College Place. Yes. And, yeah, go yeah. ahead. Uh, and I'm here on behalf of my client, and I'd like to echo the concerns raised by the chair. Uh, some of the work that is set forth in the proposal is particularly with respect to the seller, uh, raises serious life safety concerns uh, for my client. These are old historic carriage houses that were built in 1899. Uh, and at this time, although there have been some discussions, the parties have not been able to reach agreement on access agreements. And so there are serious issues uh, left to be resolved. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, although it appears that the notices for the meeting were posted publicly, uh, my client uh, found out about the meeting from a neighbor who let him know 
which was perceived by uh, my client to be a bit of a lack of transparency, given his vested interest at being his home being physically attached uh, to the project home. There was some initial excavation work that I understand was done uh, last summer. And um, the feedback that I received from my client was that that was done in a less than safe and satisfactory manner, and also without any sort of direct communication to him. Uh, and so uh, we would ask that the board perhaps consider uh, maybe an adjournment of this matter until such time as those access agreements are in place, uh, just for the purposes of ensuring the life and safety of the uh, neighboring properties. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kofler. Uh, May I have the opportunity to respond? Uh, okay, I'll give you a moment to respond. Of course. Um, letters were personally delivered to all neighbors on each side. And we can also say that any test probe or boring was done strictly within our property. I would also like to reiterate that there's been ongoing discussion with the neighbors over the course of the last year, and that any attempt to stop this process is strictly a stalling process. Okay, thank you. I uh, see a Muida Valley, sorry. I really mangled your name. Um, yes, moment. sorry. Uh -huh. Yes, no, it's Miuda. Yes, thank you. Miuda Valleys. Valleys. Yes, I, yes, thank you. Um, um, yeah, what I live on, uh, yes, I live on Henry Street. Um, and uh, I'm a little bit concerned about the ex excavation work that it's about to take place if it's approved. And I was wondering if they can provide an assessment prepared by architects, engineers, and contractors of the potential challenges from their excavation to our neighborhood. Um, I can William. jump in on that. And I think that that's a very valid concern. Doing any excavation in the city, especially in a historic district, requires monitoring of adjacent properties. This is something that our structural engineer would be working hand in hand with the Landmarks Preservation Committee and also with the Department of Building. It is common place that when you're doing excavation that the sites that are adjacent to your property can have monitoring by an independent third party monitoring company. That also includes thorough documentation of the existing condition of every adjacent property as well as monitoring periodically throughout the construction process. Usually this is something that is voluntary amongst all of the neighbors since it protects everyone. And we're hoping that we'll have that same opportunity this time. Hey, thank you. All right. Uh, do we have any other further comments from board members and committee members? I have a quick um Audrey? yeah go ahead. Thank you. Um just to follow up on on that um comment you just made Mark are are you subject to landmarks CPP requirements like are they making you do a construction protection plan for because you're in the Brooklyn Heights historic district and can you talk about the radius of that um, of requirement? Actually, that's a very valid point. We're in discussion with our staff member and we um, have discussed the radius of the zone. One thing that has a slight effect on just how substantial of the radius is gonna be affected is based on what type of um, foundation we end up digging. Um, it is a given that no matter what, we will have at least a minimally compliant radius. And um, based on how our negotiations go with our neighbors would have an effect on just how many other buildings are affected. And then one uh, final follow-up question. Sorry, Carlton. Can go you ahead. just reiterate yeah, for, for us, because um, it's been a long night, um, what the what we're vote what we're considering and what we're voting on in regards to LPC? Of course. Um, well, in regards to LPC, you're obviously voting on the rooftop addition, the front facade restoration, the rear facade above the street level, and lowering the cellar. But I want to point out that the lowering of the cellar is um, not as strong of a landmarks review, although they do have to approve it since it's in a historic district. 
it's more of a practical concern. It's not as much of an aesthetic concern since it won't have any visibility from the street. That said, it's part of our DOB filing package, therefore they'll weigh in on it. And I can also say that based on our discussions with landmarks, they have been interested in which approach we take to the seller. Thank you, uh, Ms. Ali. Go ahead, Ms. Ali. Ms. Ali, you're yourself. muted. You're muted. I wish you're I wish ahead. somebody would stop muting me all the time. <laughs> um, I think our recommendation here is just advisory and therefore it doesn't have much teeth, but I think it's a very tasteful um, presentation. And I think the what he said about DOB and the seller, it's nothing to do with what Landmarks is really working on. So I'm moving to a motion to accept as presented and let the battles continue in other forums where it's more relevant. Um, can I second that with a condition, Miss Ali? Sure. The, con the condition um, being that we ask landmarks to implement or require the architect and team to implement a construction protection plan for the neighboring properties. No, what I'm saying is the construction protection plan is a plan that's written by an engineer who's um, well-versed in this kind of work, and they determine Structural what work. kind of additional monitoring beyond the typical SOE supportive excavation scope is required because of the construction happening in a historic district. And so typically the zone of this area that would be covered in this construction protection plan is can be 90 feet, it can be 50 feet. It, it certainly encompasses more than directly adjacent neighbors. So I think that that might okay. speak. Okay, so do you want to reword the, the motion? So for the benefit of the secretary who is going to write what you're saying? Yes, she's not here, but she will do it through the recording. So what I would say is that we collective, you and I are making a motion to accept as presented on the condition that the architect work with Landmarks Protection, LPC to, uh, to create a construction protection plan that encompasses additional monitoring requirements for neighbors ad adjacent and within a zone of 50 feet. Um, uh, hi, this is Eric uh, from uh, DTLS. Uh, can I respond to that? Only if you're gonna tell me that you have one already. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's actually exactly what I was going to tell you. We have, uh, even though it is not required by the DOB to provide a, a, a construction safety plan, <clears throat> we already have a construction safety plan in place. Um, so, um, well, yeah. let me be clear. I'm sorry to interrupt you. So, there, yeah. I understand <clears throat> this scale of this job does not require a construction safety plan. I get that. What I'm talking about is very specific to LPC. It is a a uh, document that requires additional monitoring. So beyond the SOE, you probably would put vibration and seismic monitors on your direct adjacent neighbors. This would require you to do those, to implement those monitors beyond your neighbors who are directly adjacent. Because uh, one of the neighbors, I think behind you spoke about some concerns regarding excavation. And given the fact that you're in, a, in the heart at, or in the center of the Brooklyn Heights Historic District, I think that that is warranted. Um, and I would just like to add that you're absolutely right. And outside of the site safety plan, it will be mandatory for us to include it. You can include it in your notes, but we are going to be including it anyway, just based on what the Landmarks Preservation Committee was going to insist. Um, and uh, I also want to mention that our client uh, has already engaged a GZA, which will be uh, performing the monitoring throughout the project. Great. I know them. Great. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it Do sounds we like still want to put it in the motion. Yes, I okay. would say. Do so, you, do you, uh, Ms. Ali, do you accept uh, Ms. Kirk? Yes, I accept uh, the recommendation. Okay, so it's, it's on, on the table. Uh, Ms. Stanton, you have your hand up. My hand up just because there was all that discussion that was occurring between Daughtry and Azra, and this is something the Landmarks Commission always looks at in an historic district. So I'm sorry you weren't aware of that, but the applicant, I guess, has told you, of course, they're going to consider the safety of the adjacent historic houses whenever there's an excavation. I'm, uh, I'm not talking about that, Judy. 
that's not what I'm talking about. These are two distinct things, but I think the architect is clear. Is it, should I restate what I mean? This construction safety plan is a requirement from the Department of Buildings. Norm, right? Yes, be in place. Very clear. And to Judy's point, it's typical in a, in a landmarked historic district that LPC requires this. I just want to make sure that it does. That's all. No, that's very safe. Be proactive about it. Okay. Do we have any further comments or questions? We have the motions been seconded. If there are no further comments or questions, go through this. Okay, Ms. Ali. Yes. Sir, Mr. Augustus? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, Daughtry? Yes. Okay, this is not here. Oh, um, Bill Flanoy? Yes. Next is uh, Brian Holland. Yes. Okay, next well, I am. Uh, we have uh, Karen Zound, uh, Yvette Richardson. Yes. And uh, Cheryl Williams. Yes. And I'll vote yes. Also. What about Judy? Oh, me. So you were sorry. Sorry. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. So that's nine zero zero in favor. And we make sure that the uh, protections are all in place. I don't want to turn on the news and find out <laughs> on TV that this place is uh, collapsing. So I have a question sure. from Mark Barak. Yes. Are you Go any ahead, relation yeah. to Richard Barak? <laughs> yeah, I get that question all the time. He's like my dad's second cousin. Oh, OK. Well, it's not a very yeah. common name. You know, we were asked that during the community board meeting. I'm sorry, during the, <laughs> the neighborhood meeting. And um, it's because. Barak, when they came over to Ellis Island, it was probably Bronstein and they got shortened. So we've only had a couple generations of Barak. So we all kind of know each other. Well, <laughs> Richard Barak was the man who, who knew the city map like, like his ABCs. I think yeah. it's a big loss to Bar Hall that he's no longer there. Well, I actually thought he got a promotion or is am I mistaken? I think he retired, I'm not oh, sure. He retired, okay. Okay, I'm going to cut off this chitter chatter. We got things to do. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everybody. You. Right. Have a good night. Sure. Thank Bye. you. Good night. All right. Um, next is the uh, chair's report, but I don't have anything uh, on. Uh, let's see. It's uh, Next will be the... Uh, I have one quick thing, from... Carlton. Yeah, go ahead. Just want to update people on the Atlantic Avenue mixed-use project. You have oh, one... Oh, yes. Go ahead. One final opportunity to participate in the working groups um, that start later in May. If I'll put the link in the chat, but um, the land use housing and density one is on May 30th. And it's actually really interesting. And I want to make sure that I clarify. I think I misspoke. I think I was too tired last last month, That's but right. clearly right. the rezoning, there is a rezoning under consideration in this whole area. Um, I think one of my frustrations is that the tools for creating more affordable and truly affordable housing, those tools aren't changing. For example, they're not increasing the percentage of mandatory inclusionary housing that would would be implemented in the zone. But obviously the rezoning is happening. Um, but anyway, all that to say, really interesting. Also for, for Bill from Noy and other people who have a, a real interest in economic development and human you know, capital and um, jobs and all that, there's a whole separate working group for that. And then one for infrastructure. So um, I encourage you to attend. It's been fascinating. And all of the city agencies are there. City planning is sitting at the table with you and they're they're listening. So please come, I'll put the link in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, right. now, Are there any uh, from the uh, public? Any 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 uh, comments from 
the public. Hearing none. Oh, I, I see Ms. Melinda yeah. Roscoe from oh, our board. I'm hand up. Thank you. Oh, oh, yes. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. So I just want to highlight something that I feel is very important. Um, and I waited purposely until the end because I did want a lot of um, uh, neighborhood members and community members to actually hop off. But this is recorded, so they'll probably see it anyway <laughs> if they watch it back. I just want to highlight the fact that um, we must always remember that as community board members, um, we represent the needs, wants, and interests of the residents, not capitalism and not real estate developers. So when I'm hearing people voting against members who live in the district, I take serious offense to that serious offense. When you have people who serve on the community board saying, I live here, I live in the district that we're talking, I live, excuse me, I live in the area that we're talking about. You have members of the community saying the same thing, coming to this meeting, and we intentionally, or folks, I won't even say we, vote against that, I take strong offense. And then listening to the reasons, if people are saying, I'm, I'm, not in support of, an, of a project because of environmental issues. I have to breathe this air. And this is why I'm standing here before you today saying why I'm opposed to it. And then members of the board say, well, we're just gonna vote in favor and ignore everything that you said. I'm gonna be honest, those people do not deserve to serve on the board. I am taking it that far. We were appointed to represent the community, not our own self-interest, not capitalism, and not real estate developers. So that is not okay. I take strong offense to that. And I want people to remember the reason why we serve, the reason why we were appointed, in case folks may have forgotten because they've served on the board for quite some time. So like I said, earlier, and I said it much more nicer, um, but I was actually upset. Like I said earlier, I will be voting against um, uh, the first project that we had discussed. Um, I will be voting against the community, um, the committee's recommendation. Um, and I will definitely lobby and encourage others on the board to do the same because members of the district came and said, we do not want this. And for whatever reason, folks decided to vote on the side of developers, on the side of capitalism, and within their own best interests, some of whom do not even live in Borham Hill. So I just want to be clear that that was an issue for me. And I want to highlight again, we represent the residents, not our own self-interest, not capitalism, and not developers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, understand that I will just state that we can have both people, you know, on two sides of an issue, legitimate support for two on either side. Arguments can be made for either side on all, all the various issues that we get before us. And they uh, can be legitimate. I, I don't think that we have people who are supporting, let's say, a large project or whatever because they feel they're going to get something out of it. They believe that the project may be of value, or they may be, be sincerely believe that the project is not of value and may may be of a uh, may be of harm to the community. Point is that we have to when we look at this, and you'll see over time that most I think most of the people who serve on this board serve on this board because they believe that they can do something good for the community, whether or not we agree with it. We're not always going to agree. And I think that's going to be, uh, you'll see that over time. Hopefully we'll agree more often than not, but you know there will be uh, times when disagreement comes to the fore. Are there any other? Uh... Up, Carlton. Yes. Go ahead, uh, Stan. Glad that that community board member spoke. As she probably knows, I'm not a member of the community board. I'm just a member of this committee, and I did vote no on the Skirmerhorn Street hearing item. 
I think there were only two of us who voted no. And I don't think we were representing the community. And I hope that when the full board discusses it, they won't automatically adopt the committee's yes vote. I hope that the board will take the opportunity to modify. Hopefully they won't approve it, but if they do, they should apply a lot of conditions. Because I think we fail the community in our vote tonight. That's all. Understood. If there are no other, okay, thank you. I have my hand Adenia. up, uh, Mr. Chair. Yes, go ahead. I, I just want to uh, pipe in and say that there are people who say no and they represent the community, but they always say no as how it would affect themselves. They're not looking at how it affects community at large. And many of us listen and we see a way. Bill and I had an opinion that the parking is needed because we see the congestion downtown and it's easier to put the cars in a lot than to have them driving around circling looking for spot and burning gas and putting that gas into the atmosphere so it's more of a practical rather than voting for a developer um and i think we need to respect each other's vote we will we do not have to agree on everything but we must agree to disagree and that is Thank part you, of respecting your colleague on the board. Thank and you, I would like to make a motion to adjourn if, if we have nothing else. Yeah. It's almost nine o'clock. Uh, right. There are two hands up. There are two hands up. I do see the hands up. I want to give those folks a chance to uh, express their uh, sure. final opinion. Ms. Ha Brian? Thank you. Um, there's, a, there's a quote by Edmund Burke that's uh, essentially like, your representatives owe you not just their industry, but their judgment, and they betray you instead of serving you if they sacrifice uh, <clears throat> if if they sacrifice their judgment to your opinion. Um, and I, I very much believe that's the case. Um, I also voted no, um, but I, I do think that um, we're all called upon to to act in the best interest of the community. But as I said before, and as I believe Ms. Karstarfin said as well, there are people who make, <laughs> there are committee members who regularly say, you know, we should be listening to the community. And when those same people don't say it, when it doesn't align with what they want to do, um, those comments ring hollow. Um, and so I, I just, I'm, I'm not surprised, but, um, I really uh, will will take that particular thought less into consideration when I hear it from those committee members in the future. Thank you, Brian. Yvette? Hi, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to say that I think um, I think it's important to have to let people to give people the opportunity to speak. So I really want to, you know, commend Bill for like withdrawing his motion and allowing other people to. Um, to voice their concerns. So I think, so personally for me, I, I still consider myself new, even though it's been like a couple of years, I think now, mm -hmm. but I feel like putting a motion on the table quick, it just, it just kills the whole conversation. And I think that, you know, I know that we want to be brief and we want to be quick, but I think there is important to, um, to hear those, mm -hmm. those opinions. And secondly, you know, Dor um, Dorothy mentioned that we we should be able to put conditions on these motions. And I think that's really important. And it is something that we need to start, you know, doing more often. Because my opinion, which I didn't speak because there was just so much talking going on, was that, wow, it would have been, okay, maybe it would have been a little better if it wasn't four stories and just three. And is that a reasonable request for us to put on the table and move it and put a motion on like that? I, I, I don't know. So um, I think we need to understand how these conditions work when we put motions on the mm -hmm. table and, and how we could maybe provide opinion on how these proposals can be altered. That's all I got to as say. A, yeah, well, as a mem you are a member of the committee and a member of the board, you're always free to request a friendly amendment to any motion. Uh, we sort of heard one we had, and you're always free to uh, request that the maker of the motion uh, take your amendment uh, as part of the overall motion. They're free to accept it. They're free to reject it. But you are free to say, okay, well, I like some of what you have, 
but here's something else I want you to like you to consider. And you're free to do that. Having said that, it is now 8.58 p.m. I think we've I think we've gotten everything. I know Bill wants to. Bill, you want to? Okay, Bill's oh, the last one. Finish it off, Bill. Yeah, yeah, sure. Oh. Um, yeah. Um, when I realized that other committee members wanted to speak, I withdrew the motion. Thank you, Yvette, for recognizing that. And unfortunately, I wish someone had made a friendly amendment. No one actually did make a friendly amendment while before we actually started voting. Had I heard a friendly amendment, I may have actually approved it okay, or accepted it. But unfortunately, no one made the friendly amendment until after the vote was completed. So, right. well, like I said, again, the uh, the the matters, all the matters tonight will go before the general meeting. So you'll have certainly an opportunity to add on. Having said that, I think we're time to uh, finish this meeting. Adjourn. Motion to adjourn. <laughs> adjourn. Second. 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 <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm ready and, for it. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you. I, I appreciate all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yes, you for uh, picking up for me, Daughtry. Uh, of course. I, I can, we can get on, I can get on this thing quicker now with the new <laughs> whatever it is that we have to do.